Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York, and all the clouds that lured upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarums changed to merry meetings. Our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fight the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking-glass, I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up. And that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer, shall be. Dive thoughts down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. You have a good day. What means this armed guard that waits upon your grace? His Majesty, tendering my person's safety, hath appointed this conduct to convey me to the town. Upon what cause? Because my name is George. Alack, my lord, that fault is none of yours. He should for that commit your godfathers. <laughs> Belike his Majesty hath some intent that you should be new christened in the tower. <laughs> but what's the matter, Clarence, may I know? Yea, Richard, when I know. For I protest, as yet I do not. But as I can learn, he hearkens after prophecies and dreams, and from the cross row plucks the letter G, and says, A wizard told him that by G his issue disinherited should be, and for my name of George begins with G, it follows in his thought that I am he. These as I learn, and such like toys as these, hath moved his highness to commit me now. Why, this it is when men are ruled by women. Tis not the king that sends you to the tower, my lady Grey, his wife, Clarence. Tis she that tempted him to this extremity. Was it not she and that good man of worship, Antony Woodyville, her brother there, that made him send Lord Hastings to the tower? From whence this present day he is delivered? We are not safe, Clarence, we are not safe. <laughs> I think there is no man secure but the Queen's kindred, and night-walking heralds that trudge betwixt the King and Mistress Shaw. Heard you not what a humble suppliant Lord Hastings was for his delivery? Humbly complaining to her deity, God my Lord Chamberlain, his liberty. I'll tell you what. I think it is our way, if we will keep in favour with the King, to be her men and wear her livery. The jealous, awe-worn widow and herself, since that our brother dubbed them gentlewomen, are mighty gossips in our monarchy. I beseech your graces both to pardon me. His Majesty hath straightly given in charge that no man shall have private conference of what degree soever with your brother. Even so, and please, your worship, Brackenbury, you may partake of anything we say. We speak no treason, man. We say the king is wise and virtuous, and his noble queen well struck in years, fair, and not jealous. <laughs> we say that Shaw's wife hath a pretty foot, a cherry lip, a bonny eye, a passing pleasing tongue, and that the queen's kin are made gentlefolks. How say you, sir? Can you deny all this? With this, my lord, myself have naught to do. Naught to do with Mistress Shaw, I tell thee, fellow. 
He that doth naught with her excepting one were best to do it secretly alone. What one, my lord? Her husband, knave. Wouldst thou betray me? <laughs> I do beseech your grace to pardon me. Forbear your conference with the noble duke. We know thy charge, Brackenbury, and will obey. We are the queen's abjects and must obey. Brother, farewell. I will unto the king, and whatsoe'er you will employ me in, were it to call King Edward's widow sister, I will perform it to enfranchise you. Meantime, this deep disgrace in brotherhood touches me deeper than you can imagine. I know it pleases neither of us well. Well, your imprisonment shall not be long. I will deliver you, or else lie for you. Meantime, have patience. I must perforce. Well, well. Go tread the path that thou shalt ne'er return, simple, plain Clarence. I do love thee so that I will shortly send thy soul to heaven, if heaven will take the present at our hands. But who comes here? The new delivered Hastings. Good time of day unto my gracious lord. As much unto my good lord Chamberlain. Well are you welcome to the open air. How hath your lordship brooked imprisonment? With patience, noble lord, as prisoners must. But I shall live, my lord, to give them thanks that were the cause of my imprisonment. No doubt, no doubt. And so shall Clarence, too. For they that were your enemies are his, and have prevailed as much on him as you. More pity that the eagles should be mewed, while kites and buzzards prey at liberty. What news abroad? No news so bad abroad as this at home. The king is sickly, weak, and melancholy, and his physicians fear him mightily. Now, by St. John, that news is bad indeed. Oh, he hath kept an evil diet long, and overmuch consumed his royal person. It is very grievous to be thought upon. Where is he? In his bed? Uh, he is. Go you before, and I will follow you. He cannot live, I hope, and must not die till George be packed with post-horse up to heaven. I'll in to urge his hatred more to Clarence, with lies well steeled with weighty arguments. And if I fail not in my deep intent, Clarence hath not another day to live. Which done, God take King Edward to his mercy, and leave the world for me to bustle in. For then, I'll marry Warwick's youngest daughter. What, though I killed her husband and her father, the readiest way to make the wench amends is to become her husband and her father. The which will I? Not all so much for love as for another secret close intent by marrying her, which I must reach unto. But yet I run before my horse to market. Clarence still breathes. Edward still lives and reigns. When they are gone, then must I count my gains. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, sit down, your honourable load, if honour may be shrouded in a hearse, whilst I a while obsequiously lament the untimely fall of virtuous Lancaster. <laughs> Poor key cold figure of a holy king. Pale ashes of the house of Lancaster. Thou bloodless remnant of that royal blood, be it lawful that I invocate thy ghost to hear the lamentations of poor Anne, wife to thy Edward, to thy slaughtered son, stabbed by the selfsame hand that made these wounds. Lo, in these windows that let forth thy life, I pour the helpless balm of my poor eyes. Oh, cursed be the hand that made these holes! Cursed the heart that had the heart to do it! Cursed the blood that let this blood from hence! More direful hap betide that hated wretch that makes us wretched by the death of thee than I can wish to wolves, to spiders, toads, or any creeping venomed thing that lives. If ever he have child abortive be it, prodigious and untimely brought to light, whose ugly and unnatural aspect may fright the hopeful mother at the view, and that be heir to his unhappiness. If ever he have wife, 
Let her be made more miserable by the life of him than I am by my young lord's death and thee. <laughs> Come now towards Chertsey with your holy load, taken from Paul's to be interred there. And still as you are weary of this weight, rest you, whilst I lament King Henry's cause. Stay you the bell, of course, and set it down. What black magician conjures up this fiend to stop devoted charitable deeds? Villain, set down the course. Or by St. Paul, I'll make a course of him that disobeys. My lord, stand back and let the coffin pass. And man a dog, stand thou when I command. Advance thy halberd higher than my breast, or by St. Paul, I'll strike thee to my foot and spurn upon thee, beggar for thy boldness. What do you tremble? Are you all afraid? Alas, I blame you not, for you are mortal, and mortal eyes cannot endure the devil. Avaunt, thou dreadful minister of hell! Thou hadst but power over his mortal body. His soul thou canst not have. Therefore be gone. Sweet saint, for charity, be not so cursed. Foul devil, for God's sake, hence and trouble us not. For thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. If thou delight to view thy heinous deeds, behold this pattern of thy butcheries. O oh, gentlemen, see, see. Dead Henry's wounds open their congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Blush! Blush, thou lump of foul deformity! For tis thy presence that exhales this blood from cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. Thy deeds, inhuman and unnatural, provokes this deluge most unnatural. O oh God, which this blood made to avenge his death! O oh earth, which this blood drinks to avenge his death! Either heaven with lightning strike the murderer dead, or earth gape open wide and eat him quick, as thou dost swallow up this good king's blood, which his hell-governed arm hath butchered. Lady, you know no rules of charity which renders good for bad, blessings for curses. Villain, thou knowst nor law of God nor man. No beast so fierce but knows some touch of pity. But I know none and therefore am no beast. Oh, wonderful when devils tell the truth. More wonderful when angels are so angry. Vouchsafe divine perfection of a woman. Of these supposed crimes to give me leave by circumstance but to acquit myself. Vouchsafe diffused infection of a man. Of these known evils but to give me leave by circumstance to accuse thy curse itself. Fairer than time can name thee. Let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself. Fouler than heart can think thee. Thou canst make no excuse current but to hang thyself. By such despair I should accuse myself. And by despairing shalt thou stand excused for doing worthy vengeance on thyself that didst unworthy slaughter upon others. Say that I slew them not. Then say they were not slain. But dead they are, and devilish slave by thee. I did not kill your husband. Why then he is alive? Nay, he is dead and slain by Edward's hand. In thy foul throat thou liest. Queen Margaret saw thy murderous fortune smoking in his blood. The which thou once didst bend against her breast, but that thy brothers beat aside the point. I was provoked by her slanderous tongue that laid their guilt upon my guiltless shoulder. Thou was provoked by thy bloody mind that never dreamt on aught but butcheries. Didst thou not kill this king? I grant ye. Thus grant me, hedgehog. Then God grant me too, thou mayst be damned for that wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle, mild, and virtuous. The better for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven, where thou shalt never come. Let him thank me that hoped to send him thither, for he was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else. If you will hear me name it. Some dungeon. Your bedchamber. He'll rest betide the chamber where thou liest. So will it, madam, till I lie with you. I hope so. I know so. But, gentle Lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our wits and fall something into a slower method. Is not the causer of the timeless deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner? Thou wast the cause and most accursed effect. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty. 
that it haunt me in my sleep to undertake the death of all the world so I might live one hour in your sweet bosom. If I thought that, I tell thee, homicide, these nails should rent that beauty from my cheeks. These eyes could not endure your beauty's rack. You should not blemish it if I stood by. As all the world is cheered by the sun, so I by that. It is my day, my life. Black night or shade thy day, and death thy life. Curse not thyself, fair creature, thou art both. I would I wear to be revenged on thee. It is a quarrel most unnatural to be revenged on him that loveth thee. It is a quarrel just and reasonable to be revenged on him that killed my husband. He that bereft thee, lady, of thy husband, did it to help thee to a better husband. His better doth not breathe upon the earth. He lives that loves thee better than he could. Name him. Plantagenet. Why, that was he. The self same name, but one of better nature. Where is he? Here. <laughs> Why dost thou spit at me? Would it were mortal poison for thy sake. Never came poison from so sweet a place. Never hung poison on a fouler toad. Out of my sight, thou dost infect mine eyes. Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine. Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead. I would they were that I might die at once. For now they kill me with a living death. <laughs> Those eyes of thine from mine have drawn salt tears. Shame their aspect with store of childish drop. These eyes, which never shed remorseful tear, no. When my father York and Edward wept to hear the piteous moan that Rutland made when black-faced Clifford shook his sword at him. Nor when thy warlike father, like a child, told the sad story of my father's death, and twenty times made pause to sob and weep. That all the standers by had wet their cheeks like trees bedashed with rain. In that sad time, my manly eyes did scorn and humble tear. And what these sorrows could not thence exhale, thy beauty hath, and made them blind with weeping. I never sued to friend nor enemy. My tongue could never learn sweet, smoothing word, but now thy beauty is proposed, my feet. My proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak. Ugh. Teach not thy lips such scorn, for it was made for kissing, lady, not for such contempt. <laughs> if thy revengeful heart cannot forgive, lo, here I lend thee this sharp pointed sword, which if thou please to hide in this true breast, and let the soul forth that adoreth thee, I lay it naked to the deadly stroke, and humbly beg the death upon thy knee. <laughs> Nay, do not pause, for I did kill King Henry, but twas thy beauty that provoked me. <laughs> Nay, now dispatch, twas I that stabbed young Edward, but twas thy heavenly face that sent me on. <laughs> <laughs> take up the sword again, or take up me. Arise, dissembler. Though I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Then bid me kill myself, and I will do it. I have already. <laughs> that was in thy rage. Speak it again, and even with the word, this hand, which for thy love did kill thy love, shall for thy love kill a far truer love. To both their death shall thou be accessory. I would I knew thy heart. It is in my tongue. I fear me both are false. Then never man was true. Well, well, put up thy sword. Say then my peace is made. That shall thou know hereafter. But shall I live in hope? All men I hope live so. Vouchsafe to wear this ring. To take is not to give. Look how my ring encompasseth thy finger. Even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart. Wear both of them, for both of them are thine. And if thy poor devoted servant may but beg one favour of thy gracious hand, thou dost confirm his happiness forever. What is it? 
that it please you leave these sad designs to him that hath most cause to be a mourner, and presently repair to Crosby House, where after I have solemnly interred at Chertsey Monastery this noble king, and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duty see you. For diverse unknown reasons, I beseech you grant me this boon. With all my heart, and much it joys me too to see you are become so penitent. Tressel and Barclay, go along with me. Bid me farewell. It is more than you deserve, but since you teach me how to flatter you, imagine I have said farewell already. Sirs, take up the call. Towards Chertsey, noble lord. No, to Whitefriars. There attend my coming. <laughs> Was ever woman in this humour wooed? Was ever woman in this humour one? I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. What? I that killed her husband and his father to take her in her heart's extremest hate, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of my hatred by... Having God, her conscience, and these bars against me, and I, no friends to back my suit with all but the plain devil and dissembling looks. And yet to win her! All the world to nothing! Ha! Hath she forgot already that brave Prince Edward, her lord, whom I some three months since stabbed in my angry mood at Tewkesbury. A sweeter and a lovelier gentleman, framed in the prodigality of nature, young, valiant, wise, and no doubt right royal, the spacious world cannot again afford. And will she yet abase her eyes on me, but crop the golden prime of this sweet prince and made her widow to a woeful bed on me? Who's all not equals Edward's moiety? On me that halts and am misshapen thus? My dukedom to a beckler denier. I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot myself, to be a marvellous proper man. I'll be at charges for a looking glass and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favour with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. But first I'll turn yon fellow in his grave, and then return lamenting to my love. Shine out, fair son, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. Have patience, madam. There's no doubt his majesty will soon recover his accustomed health. In that you brook it ill, it makes him worse. Therefore, for God's sake, entertain good comfort and cheer his grace with quick and merry eyes. If he were dead, what would betide on me? No other harm but loss of such a lord. The loss of such a lord includes all harms. The heavens have blessed you with a goodly son to be your comforter when he is gone. Ah, he is young, and his minority is put unto the trust of Richard Gloucester. A man that loves not me, nor none of you. Is it concluded he shall be protector? It is determined, not concluded yet. But so it must be if the king miscarry. Here come the lords of Buckingham and Derby. Good time of day unto your royal grace. God make your majesty joyful as you have been. The Countess Richmond, good my lord of Derby, to your good prayer will scarcely say amen. Yet, Derby, notwithstanding she's your wife and loves not me... Be you, good lord, assured, I hate not you for her proud arrogance. I do beseech you, either not believe the envious slanders of her false accusers, or, if she be accused on true report, bear with her weakness, which I think proceeds from wayward sickness and no grounded malice. Saw you the king today, my lord of Derby? But now the Duke of Buckingham and I are come from visiting his majesty. What likelihood of his amendment, lords? Madam, good hope. 
His Grace speaks cheerfully. God grant him health. Did you confer with him? Aye, madam. He desires to make atonement between the Duke of Gloucester and your brothers, and between them and my Lord Chamberlain, and sent to warn them to his royal presence. Would all were well, but that will never be. I fear our happiness is at the height. They do me wrong, and I will not endure it. Who is it that complains unto the king that I forsooth am stern and love them not? By holy Paul, they love his grace, but likely that fill his ears with such licentious rumours, because I cannot flatter and look fair, smile in men's faces, smooth, deceive, and cog, duck with French nods and apish courtesy, I must be held a rancorous enemy. Cannot a plain man live and think no harm, but thus his simple truth must be abused with silken, sly, insinuating jack. To whom in all this presence speaks your grace? To me, that has not honesty nor grace. When have I injured thee? When done thee wrong? Or thee, or thee, or any of your faction, or play upon you all? His royal grace, whom God preserve better than you would wish, Cannot be quiet, scarce, or breathing while, but you must trouble him with lewd complaints. Brother of Gloucester, you mistake the matter. The king on his own royal disposition, and not provoked by any suitor else, aiming belike at your interior hatred, that in your outward action shows itself against my children, brothers, and myself, makes him to send, that he may learn the ground of your ill will, and thereby to remove it. I cannot tell the world is grown so bad that wrens make prey where eagles dare not perch. Since every jack became a gentleman, there's many a gentle person made a jack. Come, come, we know your meaning, Brother Gloucester. You envy my advancement and my friends. God grant we never may have need of you. Meantime, God grants that I have need of you. Our brother is imprisoned by your means, myself disgraced, and the nobility held in contempt, while great promotions are daily given to ennoble those who scarce some two days since were worth a noble. By him that raised me to this careful height from that contented hap which I enjoyed, I never did incense his majesty against the Duke of Clarence, but have been an earnest advocate to plead for him. My lord, you do me shameful injury, falsely to draw me in his vile suspects. You may deny that you were not the mean of my lord Hastings' late imprisonment. She may, my lord, She but... may, Lord Rivers. Why, who knows not so? She may do more so than denying that. She may help you to many fair preferments, and then deny her aiding hand therein, and lay those honours on your high desert. What may she not? She may, I marry may she. What marry may she? What marry may she? Marry with a king, a bachelor, and a handsome stripling, too. It was your granddam had a worse match. My lord of Gloucester, I have too long borne your blunt upbraidings and your bitter scoffs. By heaven, I will acquaint his majesty of those gross taunts that oft I have endured. I had rather be a country servant maid than a great queen with this condition, to be so baited, scorned, and stormed at. Small joy have I in being England's queen. Unless and be that small god, I beseech him. Thy honour's state and seat is due to me. What? Threat you me with telling of the king? Tell him and spare not. Look, what I have said I will avouch in the presence of the king. I dare adventure be sent to the tower. Tis time to speak. My pains are quite forgot. Ah, devil, I remember them too well. Thou killedst my husband Henry in the tower, and Edward my poor son at Tewkesbury. Ere you were queen, I, or your husband king, I was a pack horse in his great affairs, a weeder out of his proud adversaries, a liberal rewarder of his friends. To royalize his blood I spent mine own. I have much better blood than his or thine. In all which time you and your husband Grey were factious for the house of Lancaster. And rivers... So are you. Was not your husband in Margaret's battle at St. Albans slain? Let me put in your minds, if you forget, what you have been ere this, and what you are, with all what I have been, and what I am. A murderous villain, and so still thou art. Poor Clarence did forsake his father Warwick, aye, and forswore himself, which Jesu pardoned. Which God revenge. To fight on Edward's party for the crown, and for his mead, poor lord, he is mewed up. I would to God my heart were flint like Edward's, or Edward's soft and pitiful like mine. <laughs> I am too childish, foolish for this world. Hide thee to hell for shame and leave this world, thou cacker demon. There thy kingdom is. My lord of Gloucester, in those busy days which here you urge to prove us enemies, we followed then our lord, our sovereign king. So should we you, if you should be our king. If I should be, I had rather be a peddler. 
Far be it from my heart, the thought thereof. As little joy, my lord, as you suppose you should enjoy were you this country's king, as little joy you may suppose in me that I enjoy, being the queen thereof. As little joy enjoys the queen thereof, for I am she, and altogether joyless. I can no longer hold me patient. Hear me, you wrangling pirates that fall out in sharing that which you have pilled from me. Which of you trembles not that looks on me? If not that I am queen, you bow like subjects, yet that by you deposed, you quake like rebels. Ah, gentle villain, do not turn away. Foul, wrinkled witch, what makest thou in my sight? But repetition of what thou hast marred, that will I make before I let thee go. Wilt thou not banish it on pain of death? I was, but I do find more pain in banishment than death can yield me here by my abode. A husband and a son thou owes to me. And thou, a kingdom, all of you allegiance. This sorrow that I have by right is yours, and all the pleasures you usurp are mine. The curse my noble father laid on thee when thou didst crown his warlike brows with paper, mm. and with thy scorns drewst rivers from his eyes, mm. and then to dry them gave the duke a cloud <laughs> steeped in the faultless blood of pretty Rutland. <laughs> his curses then from bitterness of soul denounced against thee are all fallen upon thee. <laughs> and God, not we, have plagued thy bloody deed. So just is God to right the innocent. Oh, it was the foulest deed to slay that babe and the most merciless that e'er was heard of. Tyrants themselves wept when it was reported. Mm. No man but prophesied revenge for it. Northumberland then present wept to see. What were you snarling all before I came, ready to catch each other by the throat and turn you all your hatred now on me? Did York's dread curse prevail so much with heaven that Henry's death my lovely Edward's death, their kingdom's loss, my woeful banishment, should all but answer for that peevish brat. Oh, Can curses pierce the clouds and enter heaven? Why then, give way, dull clouds, to my quick curses. Though not by war, by surfeit die your king as ours by murder to make him a king. Edward, thy son, that now is Prince of Wales, for Edward, our son, that was Prince of Wales, die in his youth by like untimely violence. Myself a queen, for me that was a queen, outlive thy glory like my wretched self. Long mayst thou live to wail thy children's death, and see another as I see thee now, decked in thy rights as thou art stalled in mine. Long die thy happy days before thy death, and after many lengthened hours of grief, die neither mother, wife, nor England's queen. Rivers and Dorset, you were standers by, and so wast thou, Lord Hastings, when my son was stabbed with bloody daggers. God, I pray him that none of you may live his natural age but by some unlooked accident cut off. Have done thy charm, thou hateful withered hag. And leave I thee. Stay, dog, for thou shalt hear me. If heaven have any grievous plague in store, exceeding that that I can wish on thee, oh, let them keep it till thy sins be ripe. And then hurl down their indignation on thee, the troubler of the poor world's peace. A worm of conscience still be gnaw thy soul. Thy friends suspect for traitors whilst thou livest, and take deep traitors for thy dearest friends. No sleep goes up that deadly eye of thine, unless it be while some tormenting dream affrights thee with a hell of ugly devils. <laughs> thou elfish mark! Abortive rooting hog, thou that was sealed in my nativity, the slave of nature and the son of hell, thou slander of thy mother's heavy womb, thou loathed issue of thy father's loins, thou rag of honour, thou detested Margaret. Richard, huh? I call thee not. I cry thee mercy then, for I did think that thou hadst called me all these bitter names. Uh, why, so I did, but looked for no reply. Oh. Let me make a period to my curse. Tis done by me, and ends in Margaret. Thus have you breathed your curse against yourself. Poor 
painted queen, dame flourish of my fortune. Why strewst thou sugar on that bottled spider whose deadly web ensnareth thee about? Fool, fool, thou wettest a knife to kill thyself. A day will come that thou shalt wish for me to help thee curse that poisonous bunch back. False boding woman, end thy frantic curse, lest to thy harm thou move our patience. Oh, shame upon you! You have all moved mine! Were you well served, you would be taught your duty. To serve me well, you all should do me duty. Teach me to be your queen, and you my subjects. Oh, serve me well, and teach yourselves that duty. Dispute not with her, she is lunatic. Please, Master Marquis, you are malapert. Your fire new stamp of honour is scarce current. Oh, that your young nobility could judge what where to lose it and be miserable. They that stand high have many blasts to shake them, and if they fall, they dash themselves to pieces. Good counsel, Mary. Learn it. Learn it, Marquis. It touches you, my lord, as much as me. Aye, and much more. But I was born so high, our airy buildeth in the cedar's top and dallies with the wind and scorns the sun and turns the sun to shade alas alas witness my son now in the shade of death whose bright outshining beams thy cloudy wrath hath in eternal darkness folded up your airy buildeth in our airy's nest O god that ceased it do not suffer it as it is one with blood Lost be it so. Peace, peace for shame, if not for charity. Urge neither charity nor shame to me. Uncharitably with me have you dealt, and shamefully my hopes by you are butchered. My charity is outrage, life my shame, and in that shame still live my sorrow's rage. Have done, have done. Oh, princely Buckingham, I will kiss thy hand in sign of league and amity with thee. Now fair befall thee and thy noble house. Thy garments are not spotted with our blood, nor thou within the compass of my curse. Nor no one here, for curses never pass the lips of those that breathe them in the air. I will not think but they ascend the sky, and I'll wake God's gentle sleeping peace. Oh, Bucking, take heed of yonder dog. Look, when he fawns, he bites, and when he bites, his venom tooth will rankle to the death. Have not to do with him, beware of him. Sin, death, and hell have set their marks on him, and all their ministers attend on him. What does she say, my lord of Buckingham? Nothing that I respect, my gracious lord. What? Dost thou scorn me for my gentle counsel, and sue the devil that I warn thee from? Oh, but remember this another day, when he shall split thy very heart with sorrow, and say, poor Margaret was a prophetess. Live! Each of you, the subjects to his hate, and he to yours, and all of you to God. My hair doth stand on end to hear her curses. And so doth mine. I muse why she's at liberty. I cannot blame her. By God's holy mother, she hath had too much wrong. And I repent my part thereof that I have done to her. I never did her any to my knowledge. Yet you all have the vantage of her wrong. I was too hot to do somebody good that is too cold in thinking of it now. Marry, as for Clarence, he is well repaid. He is franked up to fatting for his pains. God pardon them that are the cause thereof. A virtuous and a Christian-like conclusion to pray for them that have done scathe to us. So do I ever, being well advised. For had I cursed now, I had cursed myself. Madam, his majesty doth call for you, and for your grace and yours, my gracious lord. Catesby, I come. Lords, will you go with me? We wait upon your grace. I do the wrong, and first begin to brawl. The secret mischiefs that I set a broach, I lay unto the grievous charge of others. Clarence, whom I indeed have cast in darkness, I do beweep to many simple gulls, namely to Derby, Hastings, Buckingham, and tell them tis the Queen and her allies that stir the King against the Duke, my brother. Now they believe it, and withal whet me to be revenged on rivers, Dorset Grey. But then I sigh, and with a piece of scripture tell them that God bids us do good for evil. 
And thus I clothe my naked villainy with odd old ends stolen forth of holy writ, and seem a saint when most I play the devil. But soft, here come my executioners. How now, my hardy, stout, resolved mates, are you going to dispatch this thing? We are, my lord. Come to have the warrant that we may be admitted where he is. Well thought upon. I have it here about me. When you have done, repair to Crosby Place. But, sirs, be sudden in the execution with all obdurate. Do not hear him plead. For Clarence is well spoken and perhaps may move your hearts to pity if you mark him. Tut, tut, my lord. We will not stand to prate. Talkers are no good doers, be assured. We're going to use our hands, not our tongues. <laughs> Your eyes drop millstones when fool's eyes fall tears. I like you, lads. About your business straight. Go, go. Dispatch. We will, my noble lord. Why looks your grace so heavily today? Oh, I have passed a miserable night. So full of fearful dreams, of ugly sights. But as I am a Christian faithful man, I would not spend another such a night that were to buy a world of happy days. So full of dismal terror was the time. What was your dream, my lord? I pray you, tell me. I thought that I had broken from the tower and was embarked to cross to Burgundy. And in my company, my brother Gloucester, who from my cabin tempted me to walk upon the hatches, there we looked toward England and sighted up a thousand heavy times during the wars of York and Lancaster that had befallen us. As we paced along upon the giddy footing of the hatches, we thought that Gloucester stumbled, and in falling struck me that thought to stay him overboard into the tumbling billows of the main. Oh, Lord, we thought what pain it was to drown, what dreadful noise of water in my ears. What sights of ugly death within my eyes. I thought I saw a thousand fearful racks, a thousand men that fishes gnawed upon, wedges of gold, great anchors, heaps of pearl, inestimable stones, unvalued jewels, all scattered in the bottom of the sea. Some lay in dead men's skulls, and in the holes where eyes did once inhabit, there were crept as twelve in scorn of eyes, reflecting gems that wooed the slimy bottom of the deep and mocked the dead bones that lay scattered by. Had you such leisure in the time of death to gaze upon these secrets of the deep? I thought I had, and often did I strive to yield the ghost. But still the envious flood stopped in my soul and would not let it forth to find the empty, vast and wandering air, but smothered it within my Panting book, who almost burst to belch it in the sea. Awaked you not in this sore agony? No. No. My dream was lengthened after life. Oh, then began the tempest to my soul. I passed my thought the melancholy flood, with that sour ferryman which poets write of, unto the kingdom of perpetual night. The first that there did greet my stranger soul was my great father-in-law, Renanid Warwick, who spake aloud, What scourge for perjury can this dark monarchy afford false Clarence? And so he vanished. Then came wandering by a shadow like an angel, with bright hair dabbled in blood. And he shrieked out loud, Clarence is come, false, fleeting, perjured Clarence, that stabbed me in the field by Tewkesbury. Seize on him, furious, take him unto torment. And with that, methought, a legion of foul fiends invaded me, and howled in my ears such hideous cries that with the very noise I trembling waked. And for a season after, could not believe but that I was in hell. Such terrible impression made my dream. No marvel, Lord, though it affrighted you, I am afraid methinks to hear you tell it. Keeper, Keeper, I have done these things that now give evidence against my soul for Edward's sake, and see how he requites me. Oh, God, 
if my deep prayers cannot appease thee, but I will be avenged on my misdeeds, yet execute thy wrath in me alone, or spare my guiltless wife and my poor children. Keep her. I bid thee sit by me a while. My soul is heavy, and I fain would sleep. I will, my lord. God give your grace good rest. Sorrow breaks seasons and reposing hours. Makes the night morning and the noontide night. Princes have but their titles for their glories, an outward honour for an inward toil. And for unfelt imaginations, they often feel a world of restless cares. So that between their titles and low name, there's nothing differs but the outward fame. Oh, who's here? What wouldst thou, fellow? And how camest thou hither? I would speak with Clarence, I came hither on my legs. Not so brief. Tis better, sir, than to be tedious. Let him see our commission and talk no more. I am in this commanded to deliver the noble Duke of Clarence to your hands. I will not reason what is meant hereby, because I will be guiltless from the meaning. There lies the Duke asleep, there the keys. I'll to the king and signify to him that thus I have resigned to you my charge. You may, sir, it is a point of wisdom. Fare you well. What? Uh, shall we stab him as he sleeps? No. You say it was done cowardly when he wakes. Why, well, shall never wake until the great judgment day. Mm. Why then, you say, we stabbed him sleeping? The urging of that word, judgment, hath bred a kind of remorse in me. What, art thou afraid? Not to kill him, having a warrant, but to be damned for killing him, from the which no warrant can defend me. Oh, I thought thou hadst been resolute. So I am, to let him live. Oh, I'll back to the Duke of Gloucester and tell him so. May I prithee oh. stay a little. I hope this passionate humour of mine will change. It was wont to hold me, but why one tells twenty? How dost thou feel thyself now? Some certain dregs of conscience are yet within me. Remember our reward when the deed's done. Soon as he dies, I'd forgot the reward. Oh, where's thy conscience now? Uh, in the Duke of Gloucester's purse. Oh, when he opens his purse to give us our reward, thy conscience flies out. There's no matter, let it go. There's few or none will entertain it. Oh, what if it come to thee again? I'll not meddle with it. It makes a man a coward. A man cannot steal, but it accuses him. A man cannot swear, but it checks him. A man cannot lie with his neighbour's wife, but it detects him. <laughs> it is a blushing, shame-faced spirit that mutinies in a man's bosom. It fills a man full of obstacles. It made me once restore a purse of gold that, by chance, I found. Oh, it beggars any man that keeps it. It is turned out of towns and cities for a dangerous thing, and every man that means to live well endeavours to trust to himself. Won't live without it. Oh, Tis even now at my elbow, persuading me not to kill the duke. Take that devil in thy mind, and believe him not. He would insinuate with thee, but, but to make thee sigh. Oh, I am strong-framed. He cannot prevail with me. Spoke like a tall mm. man that respects thy reputation. Come, shall we fall to work? Take him on the castard with the hilt of thy sword, and then throw him into the arms he but in the next room. Oh, excellent device. <laughs> make a sop of him. Soft. You make a strike. No. We will reason with him. Oh, where art thou, keeper? Give me a cup of wine. <laughs> you shall have wine enough, my lord anon. In God's name. What art thou? A man, as you are. But not as I am, royal. Nor you, as we are, royal. My voice is thunder. But thy looks are humble. My voice is now the king's, my looks mine own. Oh, darkly, how deadly dost thou speak. Your eyes do menace me. Why look you pale? Who sent you hither? Wherefore do you come? To... 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 To murder me. Oh, yeah. I... You scarcely have the hearts to tell me so, and therefore cannot have the hearts to do it. 
Well, then, my friends, have I offended you? you offended us you have not, but the king. I shall be reconciled to him again. Never, my lord. Therefore, prepare to die. <sighs> Are you drawn forth among a world of men to slay the innocent? What is my offence? Where is the evidence that doth accuse me? What lawful quest have given their verdict out unto the frowning judge? Or who pronounced the bitter sentence of poor Clarence's death before I be convicted by course of law? To threaten me with death is most unlawful. I charge you, as you hope to have redemption by Christ's dear blood shed for our grievous sins, that you depart and lay no hands on me. The deed you undertake is damnable. What we will do, we do upon command. And he that hath commanded is our king. Erroneous vassals, the great king of kings, hath in the table of his law commanded that thou shalt do no murder. Will you then spurn at his edict and fulfil a man's? Take heed, for he holds vengeance in his hand to hurl upon their heads that break his law. And that same vengeance doth he hurl on thee for false forswearing and for murder too. Thou didst receive the sacrament to fighting quarrel of the house of Lancaster. And like a traitor to the name of God didst break that vow, and with thy treacherous blade, and ripped the bowels of thy sovereign son. Whom thou wast sworn to cherish and defend. How canst thou urge God's dreadful law to us, when thou hast broke it in such dear degree? And as for whose sake did I that ill deed? For Edward, for my brother, for his sake. He sends you not to murder me for this, for in that sin he is as deep as I. If God will be avenged for the deed, oh, no, you, yet he doth it publicly. Take not the quarrel from his powerful arm. He needs no indirect or lawless course to cut off those that have offended him. Who made thee, then, a bloody minister, when gallant, springing, brave Plantagenet, that princely novice, was struck dead by thee? My brother's love, the devil in my rage! Thy brother's love, our duty, and thy faults provoke us hither now to slaughter thee. If you do love my brother, hate not me. I am his brother, and I love him well. If you are hired for me, go back again, and I will send you to my brother Gloucester, who shall reward you better for my life than Edward will for tidings of my death. You are deceived. Your brother Gloucester hates you. Oh, no, he loves me, and he holds me dear. Go you to him for me. Aye, so we will. Tell him, when that our princely father, York, blessed his three sons with his victorious arm and charged us from his soul to love each other, he little thought of this divided friendship bid Gloucester think on this, and he will weep. Aye, millstones, as he lessened us to weep. Oh, do not slander him, for he's kind. Right as snow in harvest. <laughs> Come, you deceive yourself. Tis he that sends us to destroy you here. It cannot be. He bewept my fortune, and hugged me in his arms, and swore with psalms that he would claim my delivery. Why, so he doth, when he delivers you from this earth's thraldom to the joys of heaven. Make peace with God, for you must die, my lord. Have you that holy feeling in your souls to counsel me to make my peace with God? And are you yet to your own soul so blind that you will war with God by murdering me? Oh, sirs, consider... They that set you on to do this deed will hate you for the deed. What shall we do? Relent and save your souls. Which of you, if you were a prince's son, being pent from liberty as I am now, if two such murderers as yourselves came to you, would not entreat for life? Even so, I beg, as you would beg, were you in my distress. Relent. No. It is cowardly and womanish. Not to relent is beastly, savage, devilish. My friend... Must by some pity in thy looks. Oh, if thine eye be not a flatterer, come thou on my side and entreat for me. A begging, Prince. What beggar pities not? Look behind you, my lord. What? Ah! Take that! And ah! oh, If all this were not do, I'll drown you in the mamsey pot with him. Bloody deed. And desperately dispatched. How oh, fain like Pilate would I wash my hands of this most grievous murder. How oh, now? What means thou that thou helpst me not? By heaven the Duke shall know like you have been. I would he knew that I had saved his brother. Take thou the fee and tell him what I say. For I repent me that the Duke is slain. So do not I. Go coward of the what? Well... I'll go hide the body in some hole till let the Duke give order for his burial. When I have my need, I will away, for this will out, and then I must not stay. Why so? Now have
have I done a good day's work. You peers continue this united league. I every day expect an embassage from my Redeemer to redeem me hence, and more to peace my soul shall part to heaven, since I have made my friends at peace on earth. Hastings and rivers take each other's hand. Dissemble not your hatred, swear your love. By heaven, my soul is purged from grudging hate, and with my hand I seal my true heart's love. So thrive I, as I truly swear the like. Take heed you dally not before your king, lest he that is the supreme king of kings confound your hidden falsehood, and award either of you to be the other's end. So prosper I, as I swear perfect love. And I, as I love Hastings with my heart. Madam... Yourself is not exempt from this, nor you, son Dorset, Buckingham, nor you. You have been factious one against the other. Wife, love Lord Hastings. Let him kiss your hand. And what you do, do it unfeignedly. There, Hastings. I will never more remember our former hatred, so thrive I and mine. Dorset, embrace him. Hastings, love Lord Marquis. This interchange of love, I here protest upon my part, shall be inviolable. And so swear I. Now, princely Buckingham, seal you this league with thy embracement to my wife's allies, and make me happy in your unity. Whenever Buckingham doth turn his hate upon your grace, but with all duteous love doth cherish you and yours, God punish me with hate in those where I expect most love. When I have most need to employ a friend and most assured that he is a friend, deep, hollow, treacherous and full of guile, be he unto me. This do I beg of heaven, when I am cold in love to you or yours. A pleasing cordial, princely Buckingham, is this thy vow unto my sickly heart. There wanteth now our brother Gloucester here to make the blessed period of this peace. And in good time, here comes Sir Richard Ratcliffe and the Duke. Good morrow to my sovereign king and queen, and princely peers, a happy time of day. Happy indeed, as we have spent the day. Gloucester, we have done deeds of charity, made peace of enmity, fair love of hate between these swelling, wrong, insensed peers. A blessed labour, my most sovereign lord. Among this princely heap, if any here by false intelligence or wrong surmise hold me a foe, if I unwittingly or in my rage have aught committed that is hardly borne by any in this presence, I desire to reconcile me to his friendly peace. Tis death to me to be at enmity. I hate it, and desire all good men's love. First, madam, I entreat true peace of you, which I will purchase with my duteous service. Of you, my noble cousin Buckingham, if ever any grudge were lodged between us. Of you, and you, Lord Rivers and Lord Dorset, that all without desert have frowned on me. Of you, Lord Woodville, and Lord Scales, of you, dukes, earls, lords, gentlemen, indeed of all. I do not know that Englishman alive with whom my soul is any jot at odds more than the infant that is born tonight. I thank my God for my humility. A holy day shall this be kept hereafter. I would to God all strifes were well compounded. My sovereign lord, I do beseech your highness to take our brother Clarence to your grace. Why, madam, have I offered love for this, to be so flouted in this royal presence? Who knows not that the gentle duke is dead? <gasps> you do him injury to scorn his course. Who knows not he is dead? Who knows he is? Oh, seeing heaven, what a world is this? Look I so pale, Lord Dorset, as the rest? Ay, my good lord, and no man in the presence but his red colour hath forsook his cheeks. Is Clarence dead? The order was reversed. But he, poor man, by your first order died, and that a winged mercury did bear. 
Some tardy cripple bear the countermand that came too lag to see him buried. God grant that some less noble and less loyal, nearer in bloody thoughts and not in blood, deserve not worse than wretched Clarence did, and yet go current from suspicion. A boon, my sovereign, for my service done. I prithee peace, my soul is full of sorrow. I will not rise unless your highness hear me. Then say at once, what is it thou requests? The forfeit, sovereign, of my servant's life, who slew today a riotous gentleman lately attendant on the Duke of Norfolk. Have I a tongue to doom my brother's death? And shall that tongue give pardon to a slave? My brother killed no man. His fault was thought, and yet his punishment was bitter death. Who sued to me for him? Who in my wrath kneeled at my feet and bid me be advised? Who spoke of brotherhood? Who spoke of love? Who told me how the poor soul did forsake the mighty Warwick and did fight for me? Who told me in the field at Chooksbury, when Oxford had me down, he rescued me and said, Dear brother, live and be a king. Who told me when we both lay in the field, frozen almost to death, how he did lap me even in his garments and did give himself all thin and naked, to the numb, cold night. All this from my remembrance, brutal wrath, sinfully plucked, and not a man of you had so much grace to put it in my mind. But when your carters or your waiting vassals have done a drunken slaughter and defaced the precious image of our dear Redeemer, you straight are on your knees for pardon, pardon. And I unjustly too must grant it you. But for my brother not a man would speak. Nor I ungracious speak unto myself for him, poor soul. The proudest of you all have been beholding to him in his life, yet none of you would once beg for his life. Oh, God, I fear thy justice will take hold on me and you and mine and yours for this. Come, Hastings, help me to my closet. Poor Clarence. This is the fruits of rashness. Mark you not how that the guilty kindred of the Queen looked pale when they did hear of Clarence's death. Oh, they did urge it still unto the King. God will revenge it. Come, lords, will you go to comfort Edward with your company? We wait upon your grace. Good grand tell us, is our father dead? No, boy. Why do you weep so oft and beat your breast and cry, O oh, Clarence, my unhappy son? Why do you look on us and shake your head and call us orphans, wretches, castaways, if that our noble father were alive? My pretty cousins, you mistake me both. I do lament the sickness of the king as loath to lose him, not your father's death. It were lost sorrow to wail one that's lost. Then you conclude, my grandam, he is dead. The king, my uncle, is to blame for it. God will revenge it, whom I will importune with earnest prayers, all to that effect. And so will I. Peace, children, peace. The king doth love you well. Incapable and shallow innocence. You cannot guess who caused your father's death. Grandam, we can. For my good uncle Gloucester told me the king, provoked to it by the queen, devised impeachments to imprison him. And when my uncle told me so, he wept and pitied me and kindly kissed my cheek, bade me rely on him as on my father. 
and he would love me dearly as a child. Ah, the deceit should steal such gentle shape, and with a virtuous vice or high deep vice. He is my son, I, and therein my shame. Yet from my dugs he drew not this deceit. Think you my uncle did dissemble, Granda? Aye, boy. I cannot think it. <laughs> Hark, what noise is this? <laughs> oh, who shall hinder me to wail and weep, to chide my fortune and torment myself? I'll join with black despair against my soul and to myself become an enemy. What means this scene of rude impatience? To mark an act of tragic violence. Edward, my lord, my son, our king, is dead. <laughs> Why grow the branches when the root is gone? Why wither not the leaves that want their sap? If you will live, lament. If die, be brief, that our swift-winged souls may catch the kings or like obedient subjects follow him to his new kingdom of ne'er-changing night. Ah, so much interest have I in thy sorrows. I had title in thy noble husband. I have bewept a worthy husband's death and lived with looking on his images. But now two mirrors of his princely semblance are cracked in pieces by malignant death, and I for comfort have but one false glass that grieves me when I see my shame in him. Thou art a widow, yet thou art a mother, and hast the comfort of thy children left. But death hath snatched my husband from mine arms and plucked two crutches from my feeble hands. Clarence and Edward, oh, what cause have I, thine being but a moiety of my moan, to overgo thy woes and drown thy cry. Our aunt, you wept not for our father's death. How can we aid you with our kindred tears? <laughs> our fatherless distress was left unknown. Your widow Donna likewise be unwept. Give me no help in lamentation. I am not barren to bring forth complaints. All springs reduce their currents to mine eyes, that I, being governed by the watery moon, may send forth plenteous tears to drown the world. Ah, oh, for my husband. Oh, my Dear Lord, oh, for our father, for our dear Lord Clarence. Alas, for both, both mine, Edward and Clarence. What stay had I but Edward and he's gone? What stay had we but Clarence and he's gone? What stays had I but they and they are gone? Was never a widow had so dear a loss? Were never orphans had so dear a loss? Was never mother had so dear a loss? Alas, I am the mother of these griefs. Their woes are parceled. Mine is general. She for an Edward weeps, and so do I. I for Clarence weep, so doth not she. These babes for Clarence weep, and so do I. I for an Edward weep, so do not they. Alas, you three on me threefold distressed, pour all your tears. I am your sorrow's nurse, and I will pamper it with lamentation. <laughs> Comfort, dear mother. God is much displeased that you take with unthankfulness his doing. In common worldly things, tis called ungrateful with dull unwillingness to repay a debt, which with a bounteous hand was kindly lent. Much more to be thus opposite with heaven. For it requires the royal debt it lent you. Madam, they think you like a careful mother of the young prince, your son. Send straight for him. Let him be crowned and him your comfort lose. Drown desperate sorrow in dead Edward's grave and plant your joys in living Edward's throne. Sister, have comfort. All of us have cause to wail the dimming of our shining star. But none can help our harms by wailing them. Madam, my mother, I do cry you mercy. I did not see your grace. Humbly on my knee, I crave your blessing. God bless thee, and put meekness in thy breast, love, charity, obedience, and true duty. Amen. And make me die a good old man. That is the butt end of a mother's blessing. I marvel that her grace did leave it out. 
you cloudy princes <laughs> and heart-sorrowing peers that bear this heavy mutual load of moan. Now cheer each other in each other's love. Though we have spent our harvest of this king, we are to reap the harvest of his son. The broken rancor of your high-swollen hearts, but lately splintered, knit and joined together, must gently be preserved, cherished and kept. Me seemeth good that with some little train forthwith from Ludlow the young prince be set hither to London to be crowned our king. Why with some little train, my lord of Buckingham? Marry, my lord, lest by a multitude the new healed wound of malice should break out which would be so much the more dangerous by how much the estate is green and yet ungoverned. Where every horse bears his commanding rein and may direct his course as please himself, as well the fear of harm as harm apparent, in my opinion, ought to be prevented. I hope the king made peace with all of us, and the compact is firm and true in me. And so in me, and so I think in all. Yet since it is but green, it should be put to no apparent likelihood of breach, which haply by much company might be urged. Therefore I say with noble Buckingham that it is meet so few should fetch the prince. And so say I. Then be it so, and go we to determine who they shall be that straight shall post to Ludlow. Madam, and you, my sister, will you go to give your censures in this business? With all our hearts. My lord... Whoever journeys to the prince, for God's sake, let not us two stay at home. For by the way, I sought occasion, as index to the story we late talked of, to part the queen's proud kindred from the prince. My other self. My counsel's consistory. My oracle. My prophet. My dear cousin. I, as a child, will go by thy direction. Toward Ludlow, then. Or we'll not stay behind. Good morrow, neighbor. Whither away so fast? I promise you, I scarcely know myself. Heard you the news abroad? Yes, that the king is dead. Ill news, by lady. Seldom comes the better. I fear, I fear it will prove a giddy world. In the neighbours, Godspeed. Give you good morrow, sir. Doth the uh, news hold of good King Edward's death? Aye, sir, it is too true. God help the while. Then, masters, look to see a troublous world. No, no, by God's good grace, his son shall reign. Well, to that land that's governed by a child. In him there is a hope of government, which in his non-age, counsel under him, and in his full and ripened years... Himself, no doubt, shall then and till then govern well. So stood the state when Henry the Sixth was crowned in Paris, but at nine months old. Stood the state so? No, no good friends. God what for then? This land was famously enriched with politic grave counsel. Then the king had virtuous uncles to protect his grace. Why, so hath this, both by his father and mother. Better it were they all came by his father, or by his father there were none at all. For emulation, who shall now be nearest, will touch us all too near, if God prevent not. Oh, full of danger is the Duke of Gloucester, and the Queen's sons and brothers, hot and proud. And were they to be ruled and not to rule, this sickly land might solace us before. Come, come, we fear the worst. All will be well. When clouds are seen, wise men put on their cloaks. When great leaves fall, then winter is at hand. When the sun sets, who doth not look for night? Untimely storms make men expect a dearth. All may be well, but if God sought it so, tis more than we deserve or I expect. Truly the hearts of men are full of fear. You cannot reason almost with a man that looks not heavily and full of dread. Before the days of change, still is it so. By a divine instinct, men's minds mistrust ensuing danger, as by proof we see the water swell before a boisterous storm. But leave it all to God. Whither away? Mary, we were sent for to the justice. Oh, yes, so was I. I'll bear you company. Last night I heard they lay at Stony Stratford, and at Northampton they do rest tonight. Tomorrow or next day they will be here. I long with all my heart to see the prince. 
I hope he's much grown since last I saw him. But I hear no. They say my son of York has almost overtained him in his growth. Aye, mother, but I would not have it so. Why, my good cousin, it is good to grow. Grandam, one night as we did sit at supper, my Uncle Rivers talked how I did grow more than my brother. I quoth my Uncle Gloucester, small herbs have grace, great weeds do grow apace. And since methinks I would not grow so fast, because sweet flowers are slow, and weeds make haste. <laughs> faith, good faith, the saying did not hold in him, but did object the same to thee. He was the richest thing when he was young, so long a growing, and so leisurely, that if his rule were true, he should be gracious. And so no doubt he is, my gracious madam. I hope he is, but yet let mothers doubt. Now, by my troth, if I had been remembered, I could have given my uncle's grace a flout to touch his growth nearer than he touched mine. How, my young York, I prithee, let me hear it. Marry, they say my uncle grew so fast that he could gnaw a crust at two hours old. But twas full two years ere I could get a tooth. Grandam, this would have been a biting jest. <laughs> <laughs> my pretty, pretty York, who told thee this? Grandam, his nurse. His nurse? Why, she was dead ere thou wast born. It were not she. I cannot tell who told me. A parlous boy, go to. You are too shrewd. Good madam, be not angry with the child. Pictures have ears. Here comes a messenger. What news? Such news, my lord, as grieves me to report. How doth the prince? Well, madam, and in health. What is thy news? Lord Rivers and Lord Grey are sent to Pomfret, and with them Sir Thomas Vaughan prisoners. <sighs> who hath committed them? The mighty dukes Gloucester and Buckingham. For what offence? The sum of all I can I have disclosed. Why or for what the nobles were committed is all unknown to me, my gracious lord. I I see the ruin of my house. The tiger now hath seized the gentle hind. Insulting tyranny begins to jet upon the innocent and aweless throne. Welcome destruction, blood and massacre. I see as in a map the end of all. The cursed and unquiet wrangling days. How many of you have mine eyes beheld? My husband lost his life to get the crown. And often up and down my sons were tossed for me to joy and weep their gain and loss. And being seated and domestic broils clean overblown, themselves, the conquerors, make war upon themselves. Brother to brother, blood to blood, self against self. Oh, preposterous and frantic outrage! End thy damned spleen, or let me die, to look on death no more. Come, come, my boy, we will to sanctuary. Madam, farewell. Stay, I will go with you. You have no call. My gracious lady, go, and thither bear your treasure and your goods. For my part, I'll resign unto your grace the seal I keep, and so be tied to me as well I tender you and all of yours. Go, I'll conduct you to the sanctuary. <laughs> Welcome, sweet prince, to London, to your chamber. Welcome, dear cousin, my thoughts, sovereign. The weary way hath made you melancholy. No, uncle, but our crosses on the way have made it tedious, wearisome, and heavy. I want more uncles here to welcome me. Sweet prince, the untainted virtue of your years hath not yet dived into the world's deceit. No more can you distinguish of a man than of his outward show, which God, he knows, seldom or never jumpeth with the heart. Those uncles which you want were dangerous. Your grace attended to their sugar words, but look not on the poison of their hearts. God keep you from them, and from such false friends. God keep me from false friends, but they were none. My lord, the mayor of London comes to greet you. God bless your grace with health and happy days. I thank you, good my lord. And thank you all. I thought my mother and my brother York would long ere this have met us on the way. Fie, what a slug is Hastings, and he comes not to tell us whether they will come or no. And in good time, here comes the sweating lord. Welcome, my lord. What, will our mother come? On what occasion, God he knows, not I. The queen, your mother, and your brother York have taken sanctuary. The tender prince would fain have come with me to meet your grace, but by his mother was perforce withheld. <laughs> Fie, what an indirect and peevish course is this of hers. Lord Cardinal, will your grace persuade the Queen to send the Duke of York unto his princely brother presently? If she deny, Lord Hastings, go with him and from her jealous arms pluck him perforce. My Lord of Buckingham, if my weak oratory can from his mother win the Duke of York, anon expect him here. 
but if she be obdurate to mild entreaties, God forbid we should infringe the holy privilege of blessed sanctuary. Not for all this land would I be guilty of so great a sin. <laughs> you are too senseless, obstinate, my lord, too ceremonious and traditional. Weigh it but with the grossness of this age. You break not sanctuary in seizing him. The benefit thereof is always granted to those whose dealings have deserved the place and those who have the wit to claim the place. This prince hath neither claimed it nor deserved it and therefore, in mine opinion, cannot have it. Then taking him from thence that is not there, you break no privilege nor charter there. Oft have I heard of sanctuary men, but sanctuary children near to love. <laughs> Oh, my lord, you shall or rule my mind for once. Come on, Lord Hastings, will you go with me? I go, my lord. Good lords, make all the speedy haste you may. Say, Uncle Gloucester, if our brother come, where shall we sojourn till our coronation? Where it seems best unto your royal self. If I may counsel you some day or two, your highness shall repose you at the tower then, where you please, and shall be thought most fit for your best health and recreation. Oh, I do not like the tower of any place. Did Julius Caesar build that place, my lord? He did, my gracious lord, begin that place, which since succeeding ages have re-edified. Oh, is it upon record, or else reported successively from age to age he built it? Upon record, my gracious lord. But say, my lord, it were not registered. Methinks the truth would live from age to age, as twere a tale to all posterity, even to the general all-ending day. So why so young, they say, do ne'er live long? What say you, uncle? I, I say, without characters, fame lives long. Thus, like the form of vice, iniquity. I, I moralize two meanings in one word. That Julius Caesar was a famous man. Mm. With what his valour did enrich his wit, his wit set down to make his valour live. Well, death makes no conquest of this conqueror, for now he lives in fame, though not in life. I'll tell you what, my cousin Buckingham. What, my gracious lord? And if I live until I be a man, I'll win our ancient right in France again, or die a soldier as I lived a king. Short summers likely have a forward spring. Now, in good time, here comes the Duke of York. Richard of York, how fares our loving brother? Well, my dread lord, so must I call you now. Aye, brother, to our grief, as it is yours. Too late he died that might have kept that title, which by his death have lost much majesty. How fares our cousin, noble lord of York? I thank you, gentle uncle. Oh, my lord, you said the title weeds are fast in growth. The prince, my brother, hath outgrown me far. He hath, my lord. And therefore is he idle? Oh, my cousin, I must not say so. Then he is more beholding to you than I. He may command me as my sovereign, but you have power in me as a kinsman. Why, pray you, uncle, give me this dagger. My dagger, little cousin, with all my heart. A beggar, brother? Of my kind uncle, that I know will give. And being but a toy, which is no grief to give. A greater gift than that I'll give, my cousin. A greater gift? Oh, that's a sword to it. Hi, <laughs> gentle cousin. Were it light enough? Oh, then I see you will but part with light gifts. In weightier <laughs> things, you'll say a beggar nay. <laughs> it is too heavy for your grace to wear. I weigh it lightly, were it heavier. What would you have my weapon, little lord? I would that I might thank you, as you call me. How? Little. <laughs> My lord of York will still be cross in talk. Uncle, your grace knows how to bear with him. You mean to bear me, not to bear with me. Uncle, my brother mocks both you and me. Because that I am little like an ape, he thinks that you should bear me on your shoulders. Ah, oh! <laughs> <laughs> and what a sharp provided wit he reasons. <laughs> to mitigate the scorn he gives his uncle, he prettily and aptly taunts himself. So cunning. And so young is oh. wonderful. My <laughs> lord, will please you pass along? Myself and my good cousin Buckingham will to your mother to entreat of her to meet you at the tower and welcome you. What, will you go unto the tower, my lord? My lord protector needs will have it so. I shall not sleep in quiet at the tower. Why? What should you fear? Marry my uncle Clarence, angry ghost. Oh. My grandam told me he was murdered there. <laughs> oh, I fear no uncle's dead. Nor none that live, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and if they live, I hope I need not fear. But come, my lord, and with a heavy heart, thinking on them, go I unto the tower. Think you, my lord, this little prating York was not incensed by his subtle mother to taunt and scorn you thus opprobriously? No doubt, no doubt. Oh, tis a perilous boy. 
bold, quick, ingenious, forward, capable. He is all the mothers from top to toe. Well, let them rest. Come hither, Catesby. Thou art sworn as deeply to effect what we intend, as closely to conceal what we impart. Thou knowest our reasons urged upon the way. What thinkst thou? Is it not an easy matter to make William Lord Hastings of our mind for the instalment of this noble duke in the seat royal of this famous isle? Mm. He, for his father's sake, so loves the prince that he will not be one to aught against him. What thinkst thou, then, of Stanley? Will not he? He will do all in all as Hastings doth. Well, then, no more but this. Go, gentle Catesby, and as it were far off, sound thou, Lord Hastings. How he doth stand affected to our purpose, and summon him tomorrow to the tower to sit about the coronation. If thou dost find him tractable to us, encourage him, and tell him all our reasons. If he be leaden, icy, cold, unwilling, be thou so too, and so break off the talk, and give us notice of his inclination. For we tomorrow hold divided counsels, wherein thyself shall highly be employed. Commend me to Lord William. Tell him, Catesby, his ancient knot of dangerous adversaries tomorrow are let blood at Pumfret Castle. And bid, my lord, for joy of this good news, give Mistress Shaw one gentle kiss the more. <laughs> good Catesby, go effect this business soundly. Eh? My good lords both, with all the heed I can. Shall we hear from you, Catesby, ere we sleep? You shall, my lord. At Crosby Hall, there shall you find us both. Now, my lord... What shall we do if we perceive Lord Hastings will not yield to our complot? Chop off his head, something we will determine. And look, when I am king, claim thou of me the earldom of Hereford and all the movables whereof the king my brother was possessed. I'll claim that promise at your grace's hand. And look to have it yielded with all kindness. Come. Let us sup betimes that afterwards we may digest our complots in some form. My lord, my lord, oh. who knocks? One from the Lord Stanley. What is the clock? Upon the stroke of four. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot my Lord Stanley sleep these tedious nights? So it appears by that, I have to say. First he commends him to your noble self. What then? Then certifies your lordship that this night he dreamt the boar had raised it off his helm. Besides, he says, there are two counsels kept, and that may be determined at the one which may make you and him to rue at the other. Therefore he sends to know your lordship's pleasure, if you will presently take horse with him, and with all speed post with him toward the north, to shun the danger that his soul divines. Ah, go, fellow, go. Return unto my lord. Bid him not fear the separated counsel. His honour and myself are at the one, and at the other is my good friend Catesby, where nothing can proceed that toucheth us whereof I shall not have intelligence. Tell him his fears are shallow without instance. <laughs> and for his dreams. I wonder he's so simple to trust the mockery of unquiet slumbers. <laughs> to fly the boar before the boar pursues, but to incense the boar to follow us and make pursuit where he did me no chase. Go, bid thy master rise and come to me, and we will both together to the tower where he shall see the boar will use us kindly. I'll go, my lord, and tell him what you say. Many good morrows to my noble lord. Good morrow, Catesby, your early stirring. <laughs> what news, what news in this our tottering state? <laughs> it is a reeling world indeed, my lord. And I believe we'll never stand upright till Richard wear the garland of the realm. Oh, wear the garland? Does not mean the crown? Aye, my good lord. I'll have this crown of mine cut from her shoulders before I'll see the crown so foul misplaced. <laughs> But uh, canst thou guess that he doth aim at it? Aye, on my life, and hopes to find you forward upon his party for the gain thereof. Uh, and thereupon he sends you this good news, that this same very day your enemies, the kindred of the Queen, must die at Pomfret. Indeed. I am no mourner for that news, because they have been still my adversaries but that I'll give my voice on Richard's side to bar my master's heirs in true descent. God knows I will not do it to the death. God keep your lordship in that gracious mind. <laughs> but I shall laugh at this a twelfth month hence, the day which brought me in my master's hate. I live to look upon their tragedy. <laughs> well, Catesby, 
ere a fortnight make me older. I'll send some packing that you'd not think of. Tis a vile thing to die, my gracious lord, when men are unprepared and look not for it. Oh, monstrous, monstrous, and so falls it out with Rivers Vaughan Grey. And so twill do with some men else that think themselves as safe as thou and I. Who was thou most dear to princely Richard and to Buckingham? The princes both make high account of you. For they account his head upon the bridge. Well, I know they do, and I have well deserved it. Ah! Come on, come on, where is your boar spear, man? Fear you the boar and go so unprovided. My lord, good morrow, good morrow, Catesby. You may jest on, but by the holy rood, I do not like these several counsels, I. My lord, I hold my life as dear as yours, and never in my days, I do protest, was it so precious to me as tis now. Think you that but I know our state secure, I would be so triumphant as I am? The lords at Pumfret, when they rode from London, were jocund, and supposed their states were sure, and they indeed had no cause to mistrust. But yet you see how soon the day or cast. This sudden stab of rancour I misdoubt. Pray God, I say, I prove a needless coward. What shall be toward the tower? The day is spent. Come, come, have with you. What you want, my lord? Today the lords you talk of are beheaded. Uh, they, for their truth, might better wear their heads than some that have accused them wear their hats. <laughs> but come, my lord, it's uh, away. Oh, go on before, I'll talk with this good fellow. How now, sirrah, how goes the world with thee? The better that your lordship please to ask. I tell thee, man... "'Tis better with me now than when thou met'st me last, where now we meet. "'Then was I going prisoner to the tower by the suggestion of the Queen's allies. "'But now, I tell thee, keep it to thyself. "'This day those enemies are put to death, and I in better state than e'er I was. "'God hold it to your honour's good content. "'Gramercy, fellow. Fair, drink that for me. Ah, "'Thank you, Your Honour. <laughs> "'Well met, my lord. I am glad to see your honour. "'I thank thee, good Sir John, with all my heart.' I'm in your debt for your last exercise. Oh. Come the next Sabbath and I will content you. <laughs> I'm talking with a priest, Lord Chamberlain. <laughs> Our friends at Pomfret, they do need the priest. Your honour hath no shriving work in hand. Uh, good faith, and when I met this holy man, the men you talk of came into my mind. Uh, what, go you toward the tower? I do, my lord. But long I cannot stay there. I shall return before your lordship, then. No, like enough for I stay dinner there. And supper, too, although thou knowest it not. Come, will you go? I'll wait upon your lordship. Sir Richard Ratcliffe, let me tell thee this. Today shalt thou behold a subject die for truth, for duty, and for loyalty. God bless the prince from all the pack of you, and not you all of damned bloodsuckers. You live that shall cry woe for this hereafter. Dispatch. The limit of your lives is out. Oh, Pomfret. Pomfret. Oh, thou bloody prison, fatal and ominous to noble peers. Within the guilty closure of thy walls, Richard II here was hacked to death. And for more slander to thy dismal seat, we give to thee our guiltless blood to drink. Now Margaret's curse is fallen upon our heads, when she exclaimed on Hastings, you and I, for standing by when Richard stabbed her son. Then curse she Richard, then curse she Buckingham, then curse she Hastings. Oh, remember God to hear her prayer for them as now for us. And for my sister and her princely sons, be satisfied, dear God, with our true blood, which, as thou knowest, unjustly must be spilt. Make haste. The hour of death is expiat. Come, Grey, come, Vaughan. Let us here embrace. Farewell, until we meet again in heaven. Now, noble peers, the cause where we are met is to determine of the coronation. In God's name, speak. When is the royal day? Is all things ready for the royal time? It is, and wants but nomination. Tomorrow, then, I judge a happy day. Who knows the Lord Protector's mind herein? Who is most inward with the noble duke? Your grace, we think, should soonest know his mind. We know each other's faces. For our hearts, he knows no more of mine than I of yours, or I of his, my lord, than you of mine. Lord Hastings, you and he are near in love. I thank his grace. I know he loves me well. Uh, but for his purpose in the coronation, I have not sounded him, nor he delivered his gracious pleasure any way therein. But you, my honourable lords, may name the time, and in the Duke's behalf, I'll give my voice, which I presume he'll take in gentle part. In happy time, here comes the Duke himself. My noble lords and cousins all, good morrow. Oh, I have been a long sleeper, but I trust my absence doth neglect no great design which by my presence might have been concluded. Had you not come upon your cue, my lord, 
William, Lord Hastings had pronounced your part. I mean your voice for crowning of the king. Then, my Lord Hastings, no man might be bolder. His lordship knows me well and loves me well. My Lord of Ely. When I was last in Holborn, I saw good strawberries in your garden. Huh? <laughs> I do beseech you, send for some of them. Mary and will, my lord, with all my heart. Cousin of Buckingham, a word with you. Mm -hmm. Catesby hath sounded Hastings in our business and finds the testy gentleman so hot that he will lose his head ere give consent his master's child, as worshipfully he terms it, shall lose the royalty of England's throne. Withdraw yourself a while, I'll go with you. We have not yet set down this day of triumph. Tomorrow, in my judgment, is too sudden, for I myself am not so well provided as else I would be were the day prolonged. Where is my lord, the Duke of Gloucester? I have sent for these strawberries. His grace looks cheerfully and smooth this morning. There's some conceit or other likes him well, when that he bids good morrow with such spirit. I think there's never a man in Christendom can lesser hide his love or hate than he, for by his face straight shall you know his heart. What of his heart perceive you in his face by any likelihood he showed today? Marry that with no man here he is offended, for were he, he had shown it in his look. I pray you all, tell me what they deserve that do conspire my death with devilish plots of damned witchcraft, and that have prevailed upon my body with their hellish charms. The tender love I bear your grace, my lord, makes me most forward in this princely presence to doom the offenders, whosoever they be. I say, my lord, they have deserved death. Then be your eyes the witness of their evil. Mm -hmm. Look how I am bewitched. Behold, thine arm is like a blasted sapling with an up. And this is Edward's wife, that monstrous witch consorted with that harlot's trumpet shore that by their witchcraft thus have marked me. If they have done this deed, my noble lord. If thou protector of this damned trumpet! Talks thou to me of ifs! Thou art a traitor! Off with his head! Now by St. Paul I swear I will not dine until I see the same! Level and Radcliffe, look that it be done! The rest that love me, rise and follow me! Come, my lord. Woe. Woe for England. Not a whit for me, for I too fond might have prevented this. Stanley did dream, the boar did raise our helms, and I did scorn it, and disdain to fly. Three times today my footcloth horse did stumble and started when he looked upon the tower, as loath to bear me to the slaughterhouse. Oh, now I need the priest that spake to me. I now repent I told the pursuivant as too triumphing how mine enemies today at Pumphret bloodily were butchered, and I myself secure in grace and favour. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, now thy heavy curse is lighted on poor Hastings' wretched head. Come, come, dispatch. The duke would be at dinner. Make a short shrift. He longs to see your head. O oh, momentary grace of mortal men, which we more hunt for than the grace of God, who builds his hope in air of your good looks, lives like a drunken sailor on a mast, ready with every nod to tumble down into the fatal bowels of the deep. Come, come, dispatched, is bootless to exclaim. O oh, bloody Richard, miserable England, I prophesy the fearfulst time to thee that ever wretched age hath looked upon. Come, lead me to the block. Bear him my head. They smile at me who shortly shall be dead. Canst thou quake and change thy colour? Murder thy breath in the middle of a word, and then again begin to stop again, as if thou wert distraught and mad with terror. <laughs> I can counterfeit the deep tragedian. <laughs> Speak and look back and pry on every side. Tremble and start at wagging of a straw. 
intending deep suspicion, ghastly looks are at my service, like enforced smiles, and both are ready in their offices at any time to grace my stratagems. But what has Catesby gone? He is. And see, he brings the mayor along. Lord Mayor! Uh, my noble Lord. Look to the drawbridge there! <laughs> ah, the drum! Catesby! Call up the walls! Lord Mayor, the reason we have sent... Look back! Defend it! Your enemies! <laughs> God and our innocence defend and guard us! Be patient! They are friends. <sighs> Ratcliffe and Lovell. Here is the head of that ignoble traitor, the dangerous and unsuspected haste. <gasps> so dear I love the man that I must weep. I took him for the plainest harmless creature that breathed upon the earth. A Christian. Made him my book wherein my soul recorded the history of all secret thoughts. So smooth he daubed his vice with sure of virtue that his apparent open guilt omitted, I mean, his conversation with Shaw's wife. He lived from all attainder of suspect. Well, well. He was the covert, sheltered traitor that ever lived. Would you imagine, or almost believe, were not that by great preservation we live to tell it, that the subtle traitor this day had plotted in the council house to murder me and my good lord of Gloucester. Had he done so? What? Think you we are Turks or infidels? Or that we would against the form of law proceed thus rashly in the villain's death, but that the extreme peril of the case, the peace of England, and our person's safety enforced us to this execution? Now, fair befall you, he deserved his death, and your good graces both have well proceeded to warn false traitors from the like attempts. I never looked for better at his hands after he once fell in with Mr. Shaw. Mm. Yet had we not determined he should die until your lordship came to see his end which now the loving haste of these our friends, something against our meanings, have prevented. Because, my lord, I would have had you hear the traitor speak and timorously confess the manner and the purpose of his treasons, that you might well have signified the same unto the citizens, who haply may misconstrue us in him and wail his death. But, my good lord, your grace's words shall serve as well as I had seen and heard him speak. And do not doubt, right noble princes both, but I'll acquaint our duteous citizens with all your just proceedings in this case. And to that end we wished your lordship here, to avoid the censures of the carping world. But since you come too late of our intent, yet witness what you hear we did intend. And so, my good lord mayor, we bid farewell. Oh, my lords. Go after. After, cousin Buckingham. The mayor towards Guildhall hies him in all post. There, at your nearest vantage of the time, in further bastardy of Edward's children. Tell them how Edward put to death a citizen only for saying he would make his son heir to the crown, meaning indeed his house, which by the sign thereof was termed so. Moreover, urge his hateful luxury and bestial appetite in change of lust, which stretched unto their servants, daughters, wives, even where his raging eye or savage heart without control lusted to make a prey. Nay, for a need, thus far come near my person. Tell them, when that my mother went with child of that insatiate Edward, noble York, my princely father, then had wars in France, and by true computation of the time found that the issue was not his begot, which well appeared in his lineaments, being nothing like the noble duke, my father, yet touched this sparingly, as to far off, because, my lord, you know my mother lives. Doubt not, my lord. I'll play the orator as if the golden fee for which I plead were for myself. And so, my lord, adieu. If you thrive well, bring them to Baynard's castle, where you shall find me well accompanied with reverend fathers and well-learned bishops. I go, and towards three or four o'clock, look for the news that the guild hall affords. Go, Lovell. With all speed to Dr. Shaw. Mm -hmm. Go thou to Friar Penker. Mm -hmm. Bid them both meet me within this hour at Baynard's castle. Now will I go to take some privy order to draw the brats of Clarence out of sight and give notice that no manner person hath any time recourse unto the princes. Here is the indictment of the good Lord Hastings which in a set hand fairly is engrossed, that it may be today read o'er in Paul's. 
and mark how well the sequel hangs together. Eleven hours I have spent to write it over, for yesternight by Catesby was it sent me. The precedent was full as long a doing, and yet within these five hours Hastings lived untainted, unexamined, free, at liberty. Here's a good world the while, hmm? Who is so gross that cannot see this palpable device, yet who so bold but says he sees it not? Bad is the world, and all will come to naught when such ill-dealing must be seen in thought. My gracious sovereign. Give me thy hand. Thus high by thy advice and thy assistance is King Richard seated. But shall we wear these glories for a day, or shall they last and we rejoice in them? Still live they, and forever let them last. <laughs> Buckingham. Now do I play the touch to try if there be current gold indeed. Hmm? Young Edward lives. Think now what I would speak. Say on, my loving lord. By Buckingham, I say I would be king. Why, so you are, my thrice renowned lord. Huh? Am I king? Tis so, but Edward lives. True, noble prince. Oh, but a consequence that Edward should still live true noble prince. <sighs> Cousin, thou wast not wont to be so dull. Shall I be plain? I wish the bastard's dead, and I would have it suddenly performed. What sayest thou now? Speak suddenly, be brief. Your grace may do your pleasure. Thou art all ice, thy kindness freezes. Say, have I thy consent that they shall die? Give me some little breath, some pause, dear lord. Before I positively speak in this, I will resolve you herein presently. The king is angry. See, he gnaws his lip. I will converse with our unwitted fools and unrespective boys. None are for me that look into me with considerate eyes. I reaching Buckingham grows circumspect. Why? My lord. Knowest thou not any whom corrupting gold will tempt unto a close exploit of death? I know a discontented gentleman whose humble means match not his haughty spirit. Uh, Gold were as good as twenty orators and will, no doubt, tempt him to anything. What is his name? His name, my lord, is Tyrrell. I partly know the man. Go, call him hither, boy. The deep revolving witty Buckingham no more shall be the neighbour of my counsel. Hath he so long held out with me untired and stops he now for breath? Well... Be it so. How now, Lord Stanley? What's the news? No, my loving lord, the Marquis Dorset, as I hear, is fled to Richmond in the parts where he abides. Come hither, Hatesby. Rumour it abroad that Anne, my wife, is very grievous sick. I will take order for her keeping close. Inquire me out some mean, poor gentleman whom I will marry straight to Clarence's daughter. The boy is foolish, and I fear him not. Look how thou dreamst. I say again, give out that Anne, my wife, is sick and like to die. About it, for it stands me much upon to stop all hopes whose growth may damage me. My lord. I must be married now to Edward's daughter, or else my kingdom stands on brittle glass. Murder her brothers, and then marry her. Uncertain way of gain, but I am in so far in blood that sin will pluck on sin. Tear falling pity dwells not in this eye. Is thy name Tyrrell? James Tyrrell, and your most obedient subject. Art thou indeed? Prove me, my gracious lord. Dost thou resolve to kill a friend of mine? Please you, I'd rather kill two enemies. Why, then thou hast it. Two deep enemies, 
Foes to my rest and my sweet sleep's disturbers are they that I would have thee deal upon, Tyrol. I mean those bastards in the tower. Let me have open means to come to them, and soon I'll rid you from the fear of them. Thou singst sweet music. Hark. Come hither, Tyrol. Go by this token. Rise and lend thine ear. There is no more but so. Say it is done, and I will love thee and prefer thee for it. I will dispatch it straight. My lord, I have considered in my mind the late request that you did sound me well, in. Well, let that rest. Dorset is fled to Richmond. I hear the news, my lord. Stanley, he is your wife's son. Well, look unto it. My lord. I claim the gift, my due by promise for which your honour and your faith is pawned. The earldom of Hereford and the movables which you have promised I shall possess. Stanley, look to your wife. If she convey letters to Richmond, you shall answer it. What says your highness to my just request? I do remember me, Henry the Sixth did prophesy that Richmond should be a king when Richmond was a little peevish boy. A king, perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps. My lord. How chance the prophet could not at that time have told me, I being by, that I should kill him. My lord, your promise for the earldom. Richmond. When last I was at Exeter, the mayor in courtesy showed me the castle and called it Richmond. At which name I started, because a bard of Ireland told me once I should not live long after I saw Richmond. My lord. I. What's the clock? I am thus bold to put your grace in mind of what you promised me. Well, but what's a clock? Upon the stroke of ten. Well, let it strike. Why, let it strike? Because that like a jack thou keep'st the stroke betwixt thy begging and my meditation. May I? I am not in the giving vein today. May it please you to resolve me Thou my troublest suit. me. I am not in the vein! And is it thus? Repays he my deep service with such contempt? Made I him king for this? Oh, let me think on Hastings and be gone to Brecknock while my fearful head is on. The tyrannous and bloody act is done. The most arch deed of piteous massacre that ever yet this land was guilty of. Dighton and Forrest, whom I did suborn to do this piece of ruthless butchery, albeit they were fleshed villains, bloody dogs, melted with tenderness and mild compassion, wept like the children in their death's sad story. Oh, thus, quoth Dighton, lay the gentle babes. Thus, thus, quoth Forrest, girdling one another within their alabaster, innocent arms. Their lips were four red roses on a stalk, which in their summer beauty kissed each other. A book of prayers on their pillow lay, which one, quoth Forrest, almost changed my mind, but oh, the devil. There the villain stopped. Whilst Dighton thus told on, we smothered the most replenished sweet work of nature that from the prime creation ere she framed. Hence both are gone with conscience and remorse. They could not speak. And so I left them both to bear this tidings to the bloody king. All health, my sovereign lord. Kind Tyrrell, am I happy in thine youth? If to have done the thing you gave in charge beget your happiness, be happy then, for it is done. But didst thou see them dead? I did, my lord. And buried, gentle Tyrrell? The chaplain of the tower hath buried them, but where, to say the truth, I do not know. Come to me, Tyrrell, soon, and after supper, when thou shalt tell the process of their death. Meantime, but think how I may do thee good, and be in hector of thy desire. Farewell till then. I humbly take my leave. 
the son of Clarence have I pent up close? His daughter, meanly, have I matched in marriage? The sons of Edward sleep in Abraham's bosom? And Anne, my wife, hath bid this world good night. Now, for I know the Breton Richmond aims at young Elizabeth, my brother's daughter, and by that knot looks proudly on the crown, to her go I, a jolly, thriving wooer. My lord! Good or bad news that thou comest in so bluntly? Bad news, my lord. Morton is fled to Richmond, and Buckingham backed with a hardy Welshman is in the field, and still his power increaseth. Ely with Richmond troubles me more near than Buckingham and his rash, levied strength. Come. I have learned that fearful commenting is leaden servitor to dull delay. Delay leads impotent and snail-paced beggary. Then fiery expedition be my wing, Jove's mercury and herald for a king. Go, muster men. My counsel is my shield. We must be brief when traitors brave the field. So, now prosperity begins to mellow and drop into the rotten mouth of death. Here in these confines, slyly have I lurked to watch the waning of mine enemies. A dire induction am I witness to, and will to France, hoping the consequence will prove as bitter, black, and tragical. Withdraw thee, wretched Margaret, who comes here. Ah, my poor princess. <laughs> my tender babe, <laughs> my unblown flowers, new appearing sweet. <laughs> if yet your gentle souls fly in the air and be not fixed in doom perpetual, hover about me with your airy wings and hear your mother's lament. Hover about her, say that right for right, have dim your infant morn to aged night. So many miseries have crazed my voice, that my woe-weary tongue is still and mute. Edward Plantagenet, why art thou dead? Plantagenet doth quit, Plantagenet. Edward for Edward pays a dying debt. Will thou, O God, fly from such gentle lambs and throw them in the entrails of the wolf? When didst thou sleep? When such a deed was done. When holy Harry died, and my sweet son. Dead life, blind sight, poor mortal living ghost. Oh, seen world shame, graves due by life usurped, brief abstract and record of tedious days, rest thy unrest on England's lawful earth, unlawfully made drunk with innocent blood. Ah, that thou wouldst as soon afford a grave as thou canst yield a melancholy seat. Then would I hide my bones, not rest them here. Ah, oh, who have any cause to mourn but we? If ancient sorrow be most reverent, give mine the benefit of scenery, and let my griefs frown on the upper hand. If sorrow can admit society, tell all your woes again by viewing mine. I had an Edward, till our witch had killed him. I had a husband till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Richard till a Richard killed him. I had a Richard too, and thou didst kill him. I had a Rutland too, thou hopes to kill him. Thou hadst a Clarence too, and Richard killed him. From forth the kennel of thy womb hath crept a hellhound that doth hunt us all to death. That dog that had his teeth before his eyes to worry lambs and lap their gentle blood, that foul defacer of God's handiwork, that excellent grand tyrant of the earth that reigns in gorded eyes of weeping souls, thy womb let loose to chase us to our graves. O oh, upright, just and true disposing God, how I do thank thee that this carnal cur preys on the issue of his mother's body and makes her pew fellow with others moan. Oh, have his wife triumph not in my woes. God witness with me, I have wept for thine. Bear with me. 
I am hungry for revenge. And now I cloy me with beholding it. Thy Edward, he is dead that killed my Edward. That other Edward dead to quit my Edward. Young York, he is but boot, because both they match not the high perfection of my loss. Thy Clarence, he is dead, that stabbed my Edward, and the beholders of this frantic play, the adulterate Hastings, rivers born grey, untimely smothered in their dusky graves. Richard yet lives. Hell's black intelligencer only reserved their factor to buy souls and send them thither. But at hand, at hand, ensues his piteous and unpitied end. Earth gapes, hell burns, fiends roar, saints pray to have him suddenly conveyed away. Cancel his bond of life, dear God, I pray, that I may live to say the dog is dead. Oh, thou didst prophesy the time would come that I should wish for thee to help me curse that bottled spider, that foul bunch-backed toad. <laughs> I call thee then vain flourish of my fortune. I call thee then poor shadow, painted queen, the presentation of but what I was, the flattering index of a direful pageant, one heaved a high to be hurled down below. A mother only mocked with two fair babes. A dream of what thou wast. A garish flag to be the aim of every dangerous shot. A sign of dignity, a breath, a bubble. A queen in jest, only to fill the scene. Where is thy husband now? Where be thy brothers? Where be thy two sons? Wherein dost thou joy? Who sues and kneels and says, God save the queen? Where be the bending peers that flatter thee? Where be the thronging troops that follow thee? <laughs> Decline all this and see what now thou art. A happy wife, a most distressed widow, for joyful mother one that wails the name, for one being sued to, one that humbly sues, for queen, a very caitiff crowned with care, for she that scorned at me, now scorned of me. For she being feared of all, now fearing one, for she commanding all, obeyed of none. Thus hath the course of justice wheeled about, and left thee but a very prey to time, having no more but thought of what thou wast, to torture thee the more. Being what thou art, thou didst usurp my place. And dost thou not usurp the just proportion of my sorrow? Now, thy proud neck bears half my burdened yoke, from which even here I slip my wearied head and leave the burden of it all on thee. Farewell, York's wife and queen of sad mischance. These English woes will make me smile in France. Oh, thou well-skilled in curses, stay a while and teach me how to curse mine enemies. Forbear to sleep the nights and fast the days. Compare dead happiness with living woe. Think that thy babes were sweeter than they were and he that slew them, fouler than he is. Bettering thy loss makes the bad causer worse. Revolving this will teach thee how to curse. My words are dull, oh, quicken them with thine. Thy woes will make them sharp and pierce like mine. Why should calamity be full of words? Windy attorneys to their clients' woes, airy succeeders of intestine joys, poor breathing orators of miseries. Let them have scope. Though what they will impart help nothing else, yet do they ease the heart. If so, then be not tongue-tied. Go with me. And in the breath of bitter words, let's 
mother, my damned son, that thy two sweet sons smothered. The trumpet sounds, be copious and exclaims, Who intercepts me in my expedition? Oh, she that might have intercepted thee by strangling thee in her accursed womb. From all the slaughters, wretch, that thou hast done. Hidest thou that forehead with a golden crown, where it should be branded, if that right were right, the slaughter of the prince that owed that crown, and the dire death of my poor sons and brothers. Tell me, thou villain slave, where are my children? Thou toad, thou toad, where is thy brother Clarence? And little Ned Pantagenet is... Where is the gentle river's Vaughan Gray? Where is kind he stays? A flourish of trumpets, like the loud drums. Let not the heavens hear these telltales of the gray on the bars anointed. Straight, I say! Either be patient and entreat me fair, or with the clamorous report of war, thus will I drown your exclamations. Art thou my son? Aye, I thank God, my father and yourself. Then patiently hear my impatience. Madam, I have a touch of your condition that cannot brook the accent of reproof. Oh, let me speak. Do then, but I'll not hear. I will be mild and gentle in my words. And brief, good mother, for I am in haste. Art thou so hasty? I have stayed for thee, God knows, in torment and in agony. And came I not at last to comfort you? No, by the holy rood, thou knowest it well. Thou camest on earth to make the earth my hell. A grievous burden was thy birth to me. Tetchy and wayward was thy infancy. Thy school days, frightful, desperate, wild and furious. Thy prime of manhood, daring, bold and venturous. Thy age confirmed, proud, subtle, sly and bloody, more mild but yet more harmful. Kind in hatred, what comfortable hour canst thou name that ever graced me with thy company? Faith, none but Humphrey hour that called your grace to breakfast once forth of my company. Uh, if I be so disgracious in your eye, let me march on and not offend you, madam. Strike up the drum. I prithee hear me speak. You speak too bitterly. Hear me a word, for I shall never speak to thee again. So. Either thou wilt die by God's just ordinance, ere from this war thou turn a conqueror, or I with grief and extreme age shall perish and never more behold thy face again. Therefore take with thee my most grievous curse, which in the day of battle tire thee more than all the complete armour that thou wearest. My prayers on the adverse party fight, and there the little souls of Edward's children whisper the spirits of thine enemies and promise them success and victory. Bloody thou art, bloody will be thy end. Shame serves thy life, and doth thy death attend. Though far more cause, yet much less spirit to curse abides in me, I say amen to her. Stay, madam. I must talk a word with you. I have no more sons of the royal blood for thee to slaughter. For oh, my daughters, Richard, they shall be praying nuns, not weeping queens, and therefore level not to hit their lives. You have a daughter called Elizabeth, virtuous and fair, royal and gracious. And must she die for this? Oh, let her live, and I'll corrupt her manners, stain her beauty, slander myself as false to Edward's bed, throw over her the veil of infamy, so she may live unscarred of bleeding slaughter. I will confess she was not Edward's daughter. Wrong not her birth. She is a royal princess. To save her life, I'll say she is not so. Her life is safest only in her birth. And only in that safety died her brothers. Lo, at their birth, good stars were opposite. No, to their lives, ill friends were contrary. All unavoided is the doom of destiny. True, when avoided grace makes destiny. My babes were destined to a fairer death if grace had blessed thee with a fairer life. You speak as if that I had slain my cousin. Cousins indeed, and by their uncle cousined of comfort, kingdom, kindred, freedom, life. Whose hand soever lanced their tender hearts, thy head all indirectly gave direction. No doubt the murderous knife was dull and blunt till it was whetted on thy stone-hard heart to revel in the entrails of my lambs. But 
that still use of grief makes wild grief tame. My tongue should to thy ears not name my boys till that my nails were anchored in thine eyes and I in such a desperate bay of death like a poor bark of sails and tackling reft rush all to pieces on thy rocky bosom. Madam, so thrive I in my enterprise and dangerous success of bloody wars as I intend more good to you and yours than ever you and yours by me were harmed. What good is covered with the face of heaven to be discovered that can do me good? The advancement of your children, gentle lady. Up to some scuffled there to lose their heads. Unto the dignity and height of fortune. The high imperial type of this earth's glory. Flatter my sorrow with report of it. Tell me, what state, what dignity, what honor canst thou demise to any child of mine? Even all I have, I and myself, and all will I withal endow a child of thine. So in the lethe of thy angry soul thou drown the sad remembrance of those wrongs which thou supposest I have done to thee. Be brief lest that the process of thy kindness last longer telling than thy kindness did. Then know that from my soul I love thy daughter. My daughter's mother thinks it with her soul. What dost thou think? That thou dost love my daughter from thy soul. So from thy soul's love didst thou love her brothers, and from my heart's love I do thank thee for it. Be not so hasty to confound my meaning, I mean that with my soul I love thy daughter and do intend to make her Queen of England. Well, then, who dost thou mean shall be her king? Even he that makes her queen, who else should be? What? Thou! Even so. How think you of it? How canst thou woo her? That would I learn of you as one being best acquainted with her humour. And wilt thou learn of me? Madam, with all my heart, Send to her by the man that slew her brothers a pair of bleeding hearts. Thereon engrave Edward and York. Then haply will she weep. Therefore present to her, as sometime Margaret did to thy father, steeped in Rutland's blood, a handkerchief which say to her did drain the purple sap from her sweet brother's body, and bid her wipe her weeping eyes withal. If this inducement move her not to love, send her a letter of thy noble deeds. Tell her thou madest away her uncle Clarence, her uncle Rivers, ay, and for her sake madest quick conveyance with her good aunt Anne. You mock me, madam. This is not the way to win your daughter. There is no other way, unless thou couldst put on some other shape and not be Richard that hath done all this. Say that I did all this for love of her. Nay, then indeed she cannot choose but hate thee, having bought love with such a bloody spoil. Look, what is done cannot now be amended. Men shall deal unadvisedly sometimes, which after hours gives leisure to repent. If I did take the kingdom from your sons to make amends, I'll give it to your daughter. If I have killed the issue of your womb to quicken your increase, I will beget mine issue of your blood upon your daughter. A grandam's name is little less in love than is the doting title of a mother. They are as children but one step below, even of your metal, of your very blood, all of one pain, save for a night of groans endured of her for whom you bid like sorrow. Your children were vexation to your youth, but mine shall be the comfort to your age. The loss you have is but a son being king, and by that loss your daughter is made queen. I cannot make you what amends I would, therefore accept such kindness as I can. Dorset, your son, that with a fearful soul leads discontented steps in foreign soil, this fair alliance quickly shall come home to high promotions and high dignity. The king that calls your beauteous daughter wife, familiarly shall call thy Dorset brother. Again you shall be mother to a king, and all the ruins of distressful times repaired with double riches of content. What, we have many goodly days to see. The liquid drops of tears that you have shed shall come again transformed to orient pearl, advantaging their loan with interest of ten times double gain of happiness. Go then, my mother, to thy daughter go. 
Make bold her bashful ears with your experience. Prepare her ears to hear a wooer's tale. Put in her tender heart the aspiring flame of golden sovereignty. Acquaint the princess with the sweet, silent hours of marriage joys. And when this arm of mine hath chastised that pretty rebel, dull-brained Buckingham, bound with triumphant garlands will I come and lead thy daughter to a conqueror's bed. To whom I will retail my conquest won, and she shall be so victorious. Caesar's Caesar. What were I best to say? Her father's brother would be her lord? Or shall I say her uncle? Or he that slew her brothers and her uncles? Under what title shall I woo for thee that God, the law, my honour and her love can make seem pleasing to her tender years? Infer fair England's peace by this alliance. Which she shall purchase with still lasting war. Tell her the king that may command entreats. That at her hands which the king's king forbids. Say she shall be a high and mighty queen. To wail the title as her mother doth. Say I will love her everlastingly. But how long shall that title ever last? Sweetly enforce unto her fair life's end. But but how long fairly shall her sweet life last? As long as heaven and nature lengthens. As long as hell and Richard likes of it. Say I, her sovereign, am her subject low. But she, your subject, loathes such sovereignty. Be eloquent in my behalf to her. An honest tale speeds best being plainly told. Then plainly to her tell my loving tale. Plain and not honest is too harsh a stuff. Your reasons are too shallow and too quick. Oh no, my reasons are too deep and dead. Too deep. Deep and dead, poor infants in their graves. Half not on that string, madam, that is past. Half on it still shall I till heart strings break. Now by my George, my garter and my crown. Profaned, dishonoured and the third usurped. I swear. By nothing, for this is no oath. Thy George profaned hath lost his lordly honour. Thy garter blemished pawned his knightly virtue. Thy crown usurped disgraced his kingly glory. If something thou wouldst swear to be believed, swear then by something that thou hast not wronged. Then by myself. Thyself is self misused. Now by the world. Tis full of thy foul wrongs. My father's death. Thy life hath it dishonoured. Why then by God? God's wrong is most of all, if thou didst fear to break an oath with him, the unity the king my husband made thou hadst not broken, nor my brothers died. If thou hadst feared to break an oath by him, the imperial metal circling now thy head had graced the tender temples of my child. And both the princes had been breathing here, which now two tender bedfellows for dust, thy broken faith hath made the prey for worms. What canst thou swear by now? The time to come. That thou hast wronged in the time or past. For I myself have many tears to wash here after time, for time past wronged by thee. The children live whose fathers thou hast slaughtered, ungoverned youth to wail it in their age. The parents live whose children thou hast butchered, old barren plants to wail it with their age. Swear not by time to come, for that thou hast misused, e'er used by times ill-used or past. As I intend to prosper and repent, so thrive I in my dangerous affairs of hostile arms. Myself, myself confound. Heaven and fortune bar me happy hours. Day, yield me not thy light, nor night thy rest. Be opposite all planets of good luck to my proceeding. If with dear heart's love, immaculate devotion, holy thoughts I tender not thy beauteous princely daughter, in her consists my happiness and thine. Without her follows to myself and thee, herself, the land and many a Christian soul, Death, desolation, ruin, and decay. It cannot be avoided but by this. 
It will not be avoided but by this. Therefore, dear mother, I must call you so. Be the attorney of my love to her. Plead what I will be, not what I have been. Not my deserts, but what I will deserve. Urge the necessity and state of times, and be not peevish, fond in great designs. Shall I be tempted of the devil thus? Aye, if the devil tempt you to do good. Shall I forget myself to be myself? Aye, if your self's remembrance wrong yourself. Yet thou didst kill my children. But in your daughter's womb I bury them, where in that nest of spicery they will breed selves of themselves to your recomfiture. Shall I go win my daughter to thy will? And be happy, mother, by the deed. I go. Write to me very shortly, and you shall understand from me Bear her my true love's kiss, and so farewell. Relenting fool and shallow changing woman. How now, what news? Most mighty sovereign, on the western coast rideth the puissant navy. To our shores throng many doubtful, hollow-hearted friends, unarmed and unresolved to beat them back. Tis thought that Richmond is their admiral. And there they howl, expecting but the aid of Buckingham to welcome them ashore. Some light-foot friend post to the Duke of Norfolk. Ratcliffe, thyself, or Catesby, where is he? Here, my good lord. Catesby, fly to the Duke. I will, my lord, with all convenient haste. Ratcliffe, come hither. Post to Salisbury. When thou comest thither... Dull, unmindful villain, why stayest thou here and goest not to the Duke? But first, mighty liege, tell me, your highness, pleasure, what from your grace I shall deliver to you. Oh, me. true, good Catesby. Bid him levy straight the greatest strength and power that he can make, and meet me suddenly at Salisbury. I go. What may it please you shall I do at Salisbury? Why, what wouldst thou do there before I go? <laughs> your highness told me I should post before. My mind is changed. Stanley, what news with you? None, good my liege, to please you with the hearing, nor none so bad, but well may be reported. I die a riddle, neither good nor bad. What needst thou run so many miles about when thou mayest tell thy tale the nearest way once more? What news? Richmond is on the seas. There let him sink and be the seas on him, white-livered runagate. What hath he there? I know not, mighty sovereign, but thy guess. Well, as you guess. Stirred up by Dorset, Buckingham and Morton, he makes for England. Here to claim the crown. Is the chair empty? Is the sword unswayed? Is the king dead? The empire unpossessed? What heir of York is there alive but we? And who is England's king but great York's heir? Then tell me, what makes he upon the sea? Unless for that, my liege, I cannot guess. Unless for that he comes to be your liege, you cannot guess wherefore the Welshman comes. Thou wilt revolt and fly to him, I fear. No, my good lord, therefore mistrust me not. Where is thy power, then, to beat him back? Where be thy tenants and thy followers? Are they not now upon the western shore, safe conducting the rebels from their ships? No, my good lord, my friends are in the north. Old friends to me, what do they do in the north when they should serve their sovereign in the west? They have not been commanded, mighty king. Please, if your majesty to give me leave, I'll muster up my friends and meet your grace where and what time your majesty shall please. Aye, thou wouldst be gone to join with Richmond, but I'll not trust thee. Most mighty sovereign, you have no cause to hold my friendship doubtful. I never was, nor never will be false. Go then and muster men! But leave behind your son George Stanley. Look, your heart be firm, or else his head's assurance is but frail. So... Deal with him as I prove true to you. My gracious sovereign, now in Devonshire, as I, my friends, am well adverted, said, Sir Edward Courtney and the haughty prelate, Bishop of Exeter, his elder brother, with many more confederates, are in arms. In Kent, my liege, the Guildfords are in arms, and every hour more competitors flock to the rebels, and their power grows strong. My lord, the army of Great Buckingham... Out on ye owls, nothing but songs of death. Ah! Oh! Take that till thou bring better news. The news I have to tell your majesty is that by sudden floods and fall of waters, Buckingham's army is dispersed and scattered, and he himself wandered away alone, no man knows whither. I cry thee mercy, there is my purse to cure that blow of thine. Hath any well-advised friend proclaimed reward to him that brings the traitor in? 
Such proclamation hath been made, my lord. Sir Thomas Lovell and Lord Marquis Dorset, tis said my liege in Yorkshire, are in arms. But this good comfort bring I to your highness. The Breton navy is dispersed by tempest. Richmond in Dorsetshire sent out a boat unto the shore to ask those on the banks if they were his assistants, yea or no, who answered him they came from Buckingham upon his party. He, mistrusting them, hoist sail, and made his course again for Bretagne. March on, march on, since we are up in arms, if not to fight with foreign enemies, yet to beat down these rebels here at home. My liege, the Duke of Buckingham is taken. That is the best news. That the Earl of Richmond is with a mighty power landed at Milford is colder news, but yet they must be told. Away towards Salisbury! While we reason here, a royal battle might be won or lost. Someone take order, Buckingham be brought to Salisbury. The rest, march on with me. Sir Christopher, tell Richmond this from me. That in the sty of the most deadly boar, my son George Stanley is franked up in hold. If I revolt, off goes young George's head. The fear of that holds off my present aid. So get thee gone. Commend me to thy lord. With all save the queen hath heartily consented he should espouse Elizabeth, her daughter. But tell me, where is princely Richmond now? At Pembroke, or at Hartford West in Wales. What men of name resort to him? Sir Walter Herbert, a renowned soldier. Sir Gilbert Talbot, Sir William Stanley, Oxford, redoubted Pembroke, Sir James Blunt, and Rice Ap Thomas, with a valiant crew, and many others of great name and worth. And towards London do they bend their power, if, by the way, they be not fought with all. Well, hide thee to thy lord, I kiss his hand. My letter will resolve him of my mind. Farewell. Will not King Richard let me speak with him? No, my good lord. Therefore be patient. Hastings and Edward's children, Grey and Rivers, Holy King Henry and thy fair son Edward, born, and all that hath miscarried by underhand corrupted foul injustice. If that your moody discontented souls do through the clouds behold this present hour, even for revenge, mock my destruction. This is All Souls Day, fellow, is it not? It is, my lord. Why then, All Souls Day is my body's doomsday. This is the day which in King Edward's time I wished might fall on me when I was found false to his children and his wife's allies. This is the day wherein I wished to fall by the false faith of him whom most I trusted. This, this All Souls Day to my fearful soul is the determined respite of my wrong. That high all-seer which I dallied with hath turned my feigned prayers on my head and given in earnest what I begged in jest. Thus doth he force the swords of wicked men to turn their own points in their master's bosoms. Thus Margaret's curse falls heavy on my neck. When he, quote she, shall split thy heart with sorrow, Remember Margaret as a prophetess. Come, lead me, officers, to the block of shame. Wrong hath but wrong, and blame the due of blame. Fellows in arms! and my most loving friends bruised underneath the yoke of tyranny. Thus far into the bowels of the land have we marched on without impediment. And here receive we from our father Stanley lines of fair comfort and encouragement. The wretched, bloody and usurping boar that spoiled your summer fields and fruitful vines 
swills your warm blood like wash and makes his trough in your emboweled bosoms. This foul swine is now even in the centre of this isle, near to the town of Leicester, as we learn. From Tamworth thither is but one day's march. In God's name, cheerily on, courageous friends, to reap the harvest of perpetual peace by this one bloody trial of sharp war. Every man's conscience is a thousand men to fight against this guilty homicide. I doubt not, but his friends will turn to us. He hath no friends, but what are friends for fear, which in his dearest need will fly from him. All for our vantage. Then in God's name, march. True hope is swift and flies with swallows' wings. Kings it makes gods, and meaner creatures kings. Here, pitch our tent, even here in Bosworth Field. My lord of Surrey, why look you so sad? My heart is ten times lighter than my lord. My lord of Norfolk? Here, most gracious liege. Norfolk, we must have knocks, huh? Must we not? We must both give and take, my loving lord. Up with my tent, here will I lie tonight. But where tomorrow? <laughs> well, all's one for that. Who hath described the numbers of these traitors? Six or seven thousand is their utmost power. Why are the tailor trebles that account? Besides, the king's name is a tower of strength, which they, upon the adverse faction, want. Up with the tent! Come, noble gentlemen. Let's survey the vantage of the ground. Call for some men of sound direction. Let's lack no discipline, make no delay, for Lord, tomorrow is a busy day. The weary sun hath made a golden set, and by the bright tract of his fiery car gives token of a goodly day tomorrow. Sir William Brandon, you shall bear my standard. Give me some ink and paper in my tent. I'll draw the form and model of our battle, limit each leader to his several charge, and part in just proportion our small power. My Lord of Oxford, you, Sir William Brandon, and you, Sir Walter Herbert, stay with me. The Earl of Pembroke keeps his regiment. Good Captain Blunt, bear my good night to him, and by the second hour in the morning, desire the Earl to see me in my tent. Yet one thing more, good Captain, do for me. Where is Lord Stanley quartered, do you know? Unless I haven't stained his colours much, which, well, I'm assured I have not done. His regiment lies half a mile at least south from the mighty power of the king. If without peril it be possible, sweet Blunt, make some good means to speak with him and give him from me this most needful note. Upon my life, my lord, I'll undertake it. And so God give you quiet rest tonight. Good night, good Captain Blunt. Come, gentlemen, let us consult upon tomorrow's business. Into my tent, the dew is raw and cold. What is the clock? It's supper time, my lord. It's nine o'clock. I will not sup tonight. Give me some ink and paper. What is my beaver easier than it was? And all my armour laid into my tent? It is, my liege, and all things are in readiness. Good Norfolk, hide thee to thy charge. Use careful watch. Choose trusty sentinels. I go, my lord. But stir with the lark tomorrow, gentle Norfolk. I warrant you, my lord. Catesby. My lord. Send out a purse with unto arms to Stanley's regiment. Bid him bring his power before sunrising, lest his son George fall into the blind cave of eternal night. Fill me a bowl of wine, my lord. Uh, give me a watch. Saddle white Surrey for the field tomorrow. Look that my staves be sound and not too heavy. Ratcliffe. My lord. Source the melancholy Lord Northumberland. Thomas, the Earl of Surrey, and himself, much about cockshot time, from troop to troop, went through the army cheering up the soldiers. So I am satisfied. Give me a bowl of wine. I have not that alacrity of spirit nor cheer of mind that I was wont to have. Set it down. Is ink and paper ready? It is, my lord. Bid my guard watch. Leave me. Ratcliffe, about the mid of night, come to my tent and help to arm me. Leave me, I say. Fortune and victory sit on thy helm. All comfort that the dark night can afford be to thy person, noble father-in-law. Tell me, how fares our loving mother? I, by attorney, bless thee for my mother, who prays continually for Richmond's good. So much for that. 
the silent hours steal on and flaky darkness breaks within the east. In brief, for so the season bids us be, prepare thy battle early in the morning and put thy fortune to the arbitrament of bloody strokes and mortal staring war. I as I may, that which I would I cannot, with best advantage will deceive the time and aid thee in this doubtful shock of arms. But on thy side I may not be too forward, lest being seen thy brother tender George be executed in his father's sight. Farewell. The leisure and the fearful time cuts off the ceremonious vows of love and ample interchange of sweet discourse which so long sundered friends should dwell upon. God give us leisure for these rites of love. Once more, adieu, be valiant and speed well. Good lords, conduct him to his regiment. I'll strive with troubled thoughts to take a nap, lest leaden slumber pays me down tomorrow when I should mount with wings of victory. Once more, good night, kind lords and gentlemen. O oh, thou, whose captain I account myself, look on my forces with a gracious eye. Put in their hands thy bruising irons of wrath, that they may crush down with a heavy fall the usurping helmets of our adversaries. Make us thy ministers of chastisement, that we may praise thee in thy victory. To thee I do commend my watchful soul, ere I let fall the windows of mine eyes. Sleeping and waking, Oh, defend me still. Let me sit heavy on thy soul tomorrow. Think how thou stabst me in my spirit. Despair, therefore, and die. Be cheerful, Richmond, for the wronged souls of butchered princes fight in thy behalf. King Henry's issue, Richmond, comforts thee. When I was mortal, my anointed body by thee was punched full of deadly hopes. Think on the tower. And we despair and die. Harry the sixth bids thee despair and die. Virtuous and holy be thou conqueror. Harry that prophesied thou shouldst be king doth comfort thee in sleep. Live Let me sit heavy in thy soul tomorrow. I that was washed to death with fulsome wine, poor Clarence, by thy guile betrayed to death. Tomorrow in the battle think on me and fall thy edges. Despair and die. Thou art spring of the house of Lancaster. The wronged heirs of York do pray for thee. Good angels guard thy battle. Live and flourish. Let me sit heavy on thy stone. Rivers, a diadem on frit, despair and die. Think upon grain, let thy soul despair. Think upon form, and with guilty fear, let fall thy lance, despair and die. Awake, and think our wrongs in Richard's bosom will conquer him. Wind the 
the day. Bloody and guilty, guiltily awake, and in a bloody battle end thy days. Think on Lord Hastings, despair and die. I am 
Ay. Is there a murderer here? No. <laughs> yes. I am. Then fly. What from myself? Great reason. Why? Lest I revenge. What myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore? For any good that I myself have done it to myself? Oh no. Alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. Yet I lie, I am not. A fool of thyself, speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree. Murder, stern murder in the direst degree. All several sins, all used in each degree, throng to the bar, crying all, Guilty! Guilty! I shall despair. There is no creature loves me. And if I die, no soul shall pity me. Nay, wherefore should they? Since that I myself find in myself no pity to myself. <sighs> Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. My lord. <laughs> Soames, who's there? Radcliffe, my lord. It is I. The early village cock hath twice done salutation to the morn. Your friends are up and buckle on their armour. Oh, Radcliffe. I have dreamed a fearful dream. What thinkst thou? Will all our friends prove true? No doubt, my lord. Oh, Radcliffe. I fear. I fear. Nay, good my lord. Be not afraid of shadows. By the Apostle Paul, shadows tonight have stroked more terror to the soul of Richard than can the substance of ten thousand soldiers armed in proof and led by shallow Richmond. Tis not yet near day. Come, go with me. Under our tents I'll play the eavesdropper to hear if any mean to shrink from me. Honor Richmond. Oh. Cramercy, lords and watchful gentlemen, that you have taken a tardy sluggard here. How have you slept, my lord? <sighs> the sweetest sleep and fairest boding dreams that ever entered in a drowsy head have I since your departure had, my lords. Methought their souls, whose bodies Richard murdered, came to my tent and cried on victory. I promise you, my heart is very jocund in the remembrance of so fair a dream. How far into the morning is it, lords? Upon the stroke of four. I think it's time to arm and give direction. <laughs> More than I have said, loving countrymen, the leisure and enforcement of the time forbids to dwell upon. Yet remember this. God and our good cause fight upon our side. The prayers of holy saints and wronged souls, like high-reared bulwarks, stand before our faces. Richard, except those whom we fight against had rather have us win than him they follow. For what is he they follow? Truly, gentlemen, a bloody tyrant and a homicide. One raised in blood and one in blood established. One that made means to come by what he hath and slaughtered those that were the means to help him. A base, foul stone made precious by the foil of England's chair where he is falsely set. One that had ever been God's enemy. 
then if you fight against God's enemy, God will in justice ward you as his soldiers. If you do sweat to put a tyrant down, you sleep in peace, the tyrant being slain. If you do fight against your country's foes, your country's fat shall pay your pains the higher. If you do fight in safeguard of your wives, your wives shall welcome home the conquerors. If you do free your children from the sword, your children's children quits it in your age. Then in the name of God and all these rights, advance your standards, draw your willing swords. For me, the ransom of my bold attempt shall be this cold corpse on the earth's cold face. But if I thrive, the gain of my attempt, the least of you shall share his part thereof. Sound drums and trumpets boldly and cheerfully. God and St. George, Richmond and Victory! What said Northumberland as touching Richmond? That he was never trained up in arms. He said the truth. And what said Surrey then? He smiled and said the better for our purpose. He was in the right, and so indeed it is. Tell the clock there. Give me a calendar. Who saw the sun today? Not I, my lord. Then he disdains to shine, for by the book he should have braved the east an hour ago. <laughs> a black day will it be to somebody? Ratcliffe, my lord. The sun will not be seen today. The sky doth frown and lower upon our army. I would these dewy tears were from the ground. Not shine today? Why, what is that to me more than to Richmond? For the self-same heaven that frowns on me looks sadly on him. Arm, arm, my lord, the foe vaunts in the field. Come, bustle, bustle. A comparison, my horse. Call up Lord Stanley, bid him bring his heart. I will lead forth my soldiers to the plain. And thus my battle shall be ordered. My foreword shall be drawn out all in length, consisting equally of horse and foot. Our archers shall be placed in the midst. John, Duke of Norfolk, Thomas, Earl of Surrey, shall have the leading of the foot and horse. They thus directed, we will follow in the main battle, whose puissance on either side shall be well winged with our chiefest horse. This and St. George to boot, what thinks thou, Norfolk? A good direction, warlike sovereign. This found I on my tent this morning. Jockey of Norfolk, be not so bold, for Dickon thy master is bought and sold. A thing defies it by the enemy. Go, gentlemen, every man to his charge. Let not our babbling dreams affright our souls. Conscience is but a word that cowers Jews. Devised at first to keep the strong in awe. Our strong arms be our conscience. Swords our law. March on. Join bravely. Let us do it pell-mell. If not to heaven, then hand in hand to hell. What shall I say more than I have inferred? Remember whom you are to cope with all. A sort of vagabonds, rascals and runaways. A scum of Bretons and base lackey peasants whom their all cloyed country vomits forth to desperate adventures and assured destruction. You sleeping safe, they bring to you unrest. You having lands and blessed with beauteous wives, they would distrain the one, disdain the other. And who doth lead them but a paltry fellow? Long kept in Bretain at our mother's cost. A milksop, one that never in his life felt so much cold as overshoes in snow. Let's whip these stragglers o'er the sea again. Lash hence these all-weaning rags of France, these famished beggars, weary of their lives, who but for dreaming on this fond exploit for want of means, poor rats had hanged themselves. If we be conquered, let men conquer us, and not these bastard Bretons, whom our fathers have in their own land beaten, bobbed, and thumped, and on record left them the heirs of shame. Shall they enjoy our lands, lie with our wives, ravish our daughters? Hark, I hear their drum. Fight, gentlemen of England. Fight boldly, yeomen. Draw archers, draw your arrows to the head. 
Spur your proud horses hard and ride in blood! Amaze the welkin with your broken state! One says Lord Stanley, will he bring his power? My lord, he doth deny to come. Off with his son George's head. My lord, the enemy is past the marsh. After the battle, let George Stanley die. A thousand hearts are great within my bosom! Advance our standards! Set upon our foes! Our ancient word of courage! Fair St. George, inspire us with the spleen of fiery dragons! Upon them! Victory sits on our head! <laughs> The king enacts more wonders than a man, daring and opposite to every danger. His horse is slain, and all on foot he fights, seeking for Richmond in the throat of death. Rescue, fair lord, or else the day is lost. My lord, I'll help you to a horse. Slave, I have set my life upon a cart, and I will stand the hazard of the die. I think there are six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. A horse! A horse! Thy kingdom Friends, the day is ours. The bloody dog is dead. Courageous Richmond, well hast thou acquit thee. Lo, here these long usurped royalties from the dead temples of this bloody wretch have I plucked off to grace thy brows withal. Wear it, enjoy it, and make much of it. Great God of heaven, say amen to all. But tell me, is thy young George Stanley living? He is, my lord, and safe in Leicester town. Whither, if you please, we may withdraw us. What men of name are slain on either side? John, Duke of Norfolk, Walter, Lord Ferrers, Sir Robert Brackenbury, and Sir William Brandon. Inter their bodies as become their births. Proclaim a pardon to the soldiers fled that in submission will return to us. And then, as we have ta'en the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile heaven upon this fair conjunction that long have frowned upon their enmity. Amen. What traitor hears me and says not, Amen. England hath long been mad and scarred herself. The brother blindly shed the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son compelled being butcher to the sire. All that divided York and Lancaster, divided in their dire division, oh, now let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance, conjoin together. And let their heirs, God, if thy will be so, enrich the time to come with smooth-faced peace, with smiling plenty and fair, prosperous days. Abate the edge of traitors, gracious lord, that would reduce these bloody days again and make poor England weep in streams of blood. Let them not live to taste this land's increase that would with treason wound this fair land's peace. Now civil wounds are stopped. Peace lives again. That she may long live here. God say, Amen. Amen.